Great. Thank you. The July Landmarks Board meeting is called to order. Welcome to the July 12th, 2023 Landmarks Board meeting. It is 6.01 p.m. Our usual moderator, Brenda Rittenauer, will be stepping back from this specific role. So Marcy will review the virtual meeting decorum this evening. Thank you, Abby. The city has engaged with community members to co-create a vision for productive, meaningful, and inclusive civic conversations. This vision supports physical and emotional safety for community members, staff, and board and commission members, as well as democracy for people of all ages, identities, lived experience, and uh, political perspectives. For more about this vision and the project's community engagement process, you can visit the link on the screen. The following are examples of rules of decorum found in the Boulder Revised Code and other guidelines that support this vision. These will be upheld during this meeting. All remarks and testimony shall be limited to matters related to city business. No participant shall make threats or use other forms of intimidation against any person. Obscenity, racial epithets, or other speech and behavior that disrupts or otherwise impedes the ability to conduct the meeting are prohibited. And participants may raise their hand to speak during open comment and public comment periods during hearings. Individual must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. And currently only audio testimony is permitted online. And I would just um, say there are a couple participants here this evening. Um, if you're planning to speak, please do go in and um, edit so that your full name is displayed and not just part of your name. And then there's one more slide, Claire. There we go. Um, so when the time comes for uh, uh, folks to speak, um, you can either hit Alt-Y on a PC or Option-Y on a Mac or star nine if you're calling in on a phone um, or under the reactions menu, there is that raise hand function um, and we'll give plenty of time for you to find that. So um, welcome to this virtual meeting and that wraps up the uh, decorum rules. Thank you, Marcy. I do want to acknowledge that we have a full quorum tonight for our board. As with in-person Landmarks board meetings, the recording of this meeting will be available in the records archives and on YouTube within 28 days of this meeting. Roll call and introductions. We'll do a real quick introduction of ourselves. I'm Abby Daniels, chair of the Landmarks board. Chelsea. Hello, I'm Chelsea Castellano, um, board member. Hi, John Decker, board member. Ronnie Pelusio, I'm also a board member. And Mark. Uh, Mark McIntyre, planning board liaison, non-voting. Th thank you, Mark. We know there are people who are here to participate this evening that may have strong emotions about particular projects. We want to hear from you and we have found it more productive if you're speaking to persuade us rather than berating us, staff, or the applicant. As with regular Landmarks board meetings, you may only speak at the appropriate time during the public hearing. Requests to speak outside of those times will be denied. As board chair, I will call for a roll call vote on any motions made this evening. So the first item on our agenda is the approval of the June meeting minutes. Does anybody have any changes or alterations to those minutes? Um, seeing no raised hands and not hearing from any of you, I move that we approve these minutes. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, so thank you, John, for seconding it. We'll do a roll call vote. Chelsea? Aye. John? Aye. Ronnie? Aye. And I vote aye. So the June 5th meeting minutes pass unanimously. We'll now proceed to the part of our agenda where we have public participation for items not on the agenda. And I don't know. Aubrey, Marcy, or Brenda, if you see anyone who has begun to raise their hands, who All would right. like to speak. 
speak. Thank you. So yes, now is the opportunity if you'd like to speak to an item that's not a public hearing this evening, um, go ahead and, and find the raise hand function. Um, I see two speakers, Abby. Um, the first is Lynn Siegel, the second is Patrick O'Rourke. Thank you, Marcy. And when you do speak, please state your full name and then you will proceed. You will have three minutes to speak. So Lynn Siegel. Yeah, I've got to be at 610 at OSBT. Um, yeah, um, I just want to say about the millennium, you know, we're losing our base in Boulder when we're not preserving these the these spectacular buildings that that we have. And when we're, you know, tripling the quantity of people in them and we lose our sales tax revenue, you know, instead we've got you know, instead of 269 folks bringing in sales tax revenue to Boulder, we have 900 some um, going to see you. Uh, um, this really should have been changed. This should not, this, this building should have been preserved, um, not unlike 770 Circle Place. Um, the, what's, you know, ironically, What's coming up now, it's five hours before. Now it's five hours again last night. It's going to be five hours again um, on the, the pure mass of the face of this project from CU that CU is going to get all the income from. And we need this. The, the historic preservation costs a lot, and we're losing it in our uh, uh, in handing over to CU. Um, it's it's stark walls there, four stories high. They should not be given anything because of the flood plain. That's not your purview. It's planning board. But <laughs> but I just don't understand how these kind of things can happen in Boulder. That millennium could have been well preserved and expanded a little bit, but it's not and it didn't, and now it's re receiving a lot of hassle in the community, and nobody can play tennis anymore. They have to commute to come play tennis. Um, it's, it's just not acceptable what's, what's happened in that space, and so I don't trust Landmarks Board to do the next thing, do the right thing. I think these things are going to just slip by, and pretty soon, all you're going to have to look at the landmarks of the future are going to be mindless buildings like what I just saw at Design Advisory Board at 2206 Pearl, a, a very, you know, unpleasant looking building with 300 square feet, you know, rented by the bedroom at the Millennium. It, it, it's just dollar signs everywhere. And it's not integrity anymore for the community. And that's what the Landmarks Board is about, is preserving the integrity of our historical, you know, value in this community. And it's not happening here. And why? Why? Why was the millennium just dumped like that? This is utterly wasteful of our historic assets done. Thank you, Lynn. Patrick? Hi, I asked um, for two pictures to be put up on the screen while I'm talking, if that's possible, when we could start. There you go. Thank you, Claire. I'm going to talk to about two things before the, at open comment. One will be. Uh, the ban shell and what happened on June 20th of last year, nothing to do with the applications in today. And the other one is a CLA. So I went back and listened to the, the YouTube videos from the June 14th meeting of 2022. The reason the Landmarks Board or James Hewitt recommended that the city council not approve it were three reasons. One, the HIP wasn't done. Number two, they wanted collaboration. And number three is that he felt it would be better or holistically done in a historic district. Then today I listened to what Allie Rhodes said. It wasn't the same message, and this is the same staff. Allie Rhodes was dealing with 
about her question was process. And more important was her last quote, and I recorded it if you want to listen to it later, is she questioned the motive of the people that had put the application in. And the reason she questioned the motive is because of the 2015 comprehensive plan that was done for that whole area, which is disappointing because that was questioning the motivation of the people involved was unacceptable. Regarding the CLA, I, ha I have some concerns on it. Number one, I question the reason why the CLA was only given to the Parks and Recreation and the Planning Board to review and not given to the Landmarks Board. I find that unacceptable. Also, um, the, the assumptions that are made in the proposal, the memo that was given to these boards is, in, is wrong. So I just wanted that to be put on the agenda. The, the reason I asked for the CLA is what, it was my proposal to have a cultural landscape assessment that included the entire creek. You see the two pictures in front of you? The one on the right is what is currently the Silver Saddle Hotel motel. That's the 34 townhouses that is being built. That's on Boulder Creek. I don't know how that could have been acceptable. That's a nine foot or 10 foot wall on the left and it abuts the creek. And then the second question I have is this is phase one and we're going into phase two of this um, development. Phase one has this chain link and these posts. There's 2000 linear feet of chain link uh, in that area between the municipal building and the library. And I just question, is that an acceptable solution? And are, is the parks and recreation planning to do that same concept if they found it acceptable there over at this new location? Uh, plus there's, and I calculated it today, there's 5,000 linear feet of development going on in the next 10 years along Boulder Creek from the, the mouth of the canyon to 28th Street. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Are there um, any additional members of the public who would like to speak? There are. So um, Leonard Siegel is next, followed by Bob. And Bob, we'll need your full name um, if you're planning to speak. And then um, Catherine Barth will follow. And um, just a reminder to uh, speak about items not on the agenda for public hearings. I know there are very closely related issues, but um, the time for public comment on those uh, will be later. Thank you, Marcy, for that important reminder. Um, Leonard Siegel, I, I know you know to state your full name and then your three minutes will commence. Leonard Siegel here, thank you, uh, Landmarks Board. Um, I just wanted to uh, bring up um, the uh, Colorado uh, Preservation Incorporated Saving Places Conference that is going to be taking place in Boulder um, and encourage the Landmarks Board to get involved with the planning of this. So I, I'm speaking on behalf of Historic Boulder. We are involved in the planning right now for this conference and the planning committee is looking for um, Boulder organizations to provide keynote speakers, to provide uh, ideas for panels and ideas for tours and also individual education sessions. And the topic is called Rethink, Refine, Revive, Forging a Resilient Future with Historic Preservation. And it, what better place than Boulder to have this topic being put forward. And like we did last year, Historic Boulder would like to collaborate with uh, the Landmarks Board or the Preservation Planners to come up with uh, programs for this event. And the deadline for these submittals is around the 7th of August. So uh, please uh, let's put our heads together, try to come up with some ideas for sessions and speakers and tours and uh, get Boulder to showcase itself in the best way possible and to get attention to Boulder preservation in the way that we think would serve this community and the board and, and the city. So that's all I wanted to say tonight. And uh, other than please reach out to me and uh, let's maybe, uh, not maybe, let's put together a, a meeting to try to brainstorm some ideas soon, okay? Thank you very much.
Thank you, Leonard, and thank you for your heads up about this because I know it is going to approach much sooner than we all think. Um, and I apologize, Marcy, next was Bob. And um, Bob, if you could state your full name um, at the beginning of your comments. And then followed by Catherine Barr. Thank you. Okay, so uh, frankly, I'm not planning to talk off the record. I just can't figure out how to tell you what my full name is. I got a note in the chat from Brenda and my chat says that it's disabled. So I don't know how to how to respond. So my full well, name is Robert Muckle. Thank you. <laughs> and I'll talk to you later. <laughs> I mean, since my time's still running, I'll just say I, I, I support everything that Len just said. I think the CPI, you know, when CPI Colorado uh, Preservation Inc. came to Boulder last year, they said they wouldn't come back because you know they don't do the same they were they were planning on moving around uh, around the state and then their experience in Boulder was so good they decided to do it again in Boulder so that's that's a great thing we should really take advantage of thank you bob and we'll look forward to hearing from you later um Catherine Barth All right, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, um, I'm not going to speak about anything that we're speaking about later. What I am going to um, speak about is today I spent some time rereading some um, historic preservation city materials. And uh, what I really spent some time on was our historic preservation plan. And um, I was part of the group of citizens that um, Marcy convened in 2013, and um, it was really a good job. The, the uh, interface with the community and many of us, uh, I, I just went back and I read it again. And I think it's a very worthy document. It's been, it was, um, I guess, revised or it was brought up to date in 2018 and, and maybe it'll be brought up to date again uh, this year in 2023, I guess, is it supposed to be every five years? But I think it is an excellent document. And I think, I don't know, I think it should be required reading or we should put it on the buses or something. But um, it's it, it was really good, and I think I'm glad I reread it. And we have a good program in this town, and we just have to be faithful to it. So thank you so much, Marcy, for all your work so many years ago, and we are still at it. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Catherine. And I don't see anyone else with their hand raised for... Um, open comment this evening so i'll just give it a little more time if you there's anyone else who would like to speak to something um, that's not a public hearing this evening go ahead and, and um, use the raise hand function otherwise abby i believe that is it for this evening so oh, this sorry so the one late cover oh i see you um katie peterson uh cpi Hi, welcome, Katie, and if you would state your full name and then your three minutes will begin. Good evening, everybody. My name is Katie Peterson. I am the Endangered Places Program Director for Colorado Preservation, Inc. Um, I just want to echo Leonard's statement here. We are so thrilled to have uh, our conference in Boulder again next year, and uh, we'd love to work with, I know I've been talking with Marcy, and she's been absolutely amazing, so um, I'd love to work with the, uh, the Landmarks Board, and uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me or our Events and Development Manager, Nicole Bob. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks for having me here tonight. Thank you, Katie. Okay, Marcy, once again, any more raised hands? Let's give it um, Brenda seven seconds um, to count down 
um, if there's any uh, final speakers this evening. And I would say seeing none, it's safe to move on. Okay, and I just wanna make a very quick comment about what Leonard, Bob, and Katie just said. One idea off the top of my head, I believe in 2024, the landmarks, I mean, the preservation program in the city of Boulder celebrates its 50th anniversary. So we might find a way to weave that in to something during the conference. So we now will officially close public comment and we will move on to discussion of landmark alteration and demolition applications issued and pending. So sorry, that's me. Um, so there are two uh, pending stays of demolition. Um, well, technically there's actually just one. So um, 1741 Walnut, um, this is one that the board put a stay of demolition back in March. Um, we had two meetings, one virtual, one on site in April. In May, the Landmarks Board voted to hold a stay of demolition, uh, a hearing prior to the stay of demolition expiring. Um, this one is moving towards, I think, a positive outcome of preserving the alley side of the building. Um, and so the applicant team is still working on getting a revised set to propose partial demolition rather than full demolition. And they asked for um, additional time. And so we signed a tolling agreement to extend the timeline in June and then um, an extension in July. So currently the stay of demolition expires on September 14th. And um, so we would expect a hearing in uh, September. And then the next one, Claire, if you don't mind going to the next slide, is um, 1918 Pine Street. This is um, a public hearing later on this evening. Um, the uh, Landmarks Board put a stay of demolition on the application in April. And then in June, the board voted to hold a hearing prior to the stay expiring. We had an on site meeting the next day, um, spoke with the owner, met with him. He's willing to. Um, work with the house, preserve the um, oldest part, which is quite old, um, and then remove some of the later additions. And um, that will allow the preservation of the house, um, but also potential to expand it. So um, the owner has withdrawn the full demolition uh, request. And so this day of demolition um, has been, is no longer. And uh, later this evening, the board will consider um, initiation of landmark designation, um, though our recommendation is based on the state, the application being withdrawn. So any questions on either one of those cases? Ronnie. Yeah, if you could go back to slide eight. Um, what is the, I mean, it sounds to me, I, I think I understand is the, the, the plan is that they're preserving this facade um are they is there a route in which there's some sort of designation process um that they're planning on pursuing um for this building and it's this elevation yeah that's a good question i think that this um stay of demolition has come up with an outcome where in my opinion it's still successful even though the building won't be designated um, it will be preserved, but outside of the program. I think that this is a pretty unique building in that it is very utilitarian and the front of the building actually faces the alleyway. And so um, the solution that was discussed during the stay of demolition is incorporating the alleyway and then the sidewalls, um, but not pursuing landmark designation for the building. And I'm sure we'll get to talk more about this in the future. So I'll wait another night to have more questions. Thanks. Thank you. And John. Um, the only question I have is, is that we this is not something that's going to be designated in the traditional sense. Is there any way to acknowledge Landmarks Board's involvement in the process and the fact that this was a partial preservation? a plaque or some type of instrument that could that could 
make that acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to explore creative ways, you know, especially as you walk along the alleyway and there are these kind of remnants left as you um, walk downtown. Um, so yes, let's brainstorm and think about about ways. I don't think there's a um, established way to do that, but that doesn't mean that that there couldn't be some sort of plaque um, in the future. Or, or historical marker, something that gives a little explanation of this. Mm -hmm. Great idea. Just a thought. All right, any other questions or discussion about the um, phase of demolition? I just want to make a really quick comment, and I know one of these um, properties we'll be discussing later this evening, but I want to give a shout out to staff and, and the Landmarks board members who have signed up for various properties. I think recently the stays of demolition and the meetings and what has happened during those have been some of the most successful I've seen in the years I've um, been involved with the landmark sport in one fashion or another. And so, you know, I, I just think there have been some great outcomes and I just, the process works and there have been some very fruitful conversations and some good things are happening because of the time and energy spent on that. So thank you. I really appreciate that, Abby, and it was one thing that I had in mind to bring up at the retreat, because the demolition reviews can often be the most contentious cases that we review, but I think that um, the uh, applicants have um, kind of understood what the process is and have come into it with open minds, and then the um, Landmarks board members who have volunteered to represent the board have come up with some really creative alternatives and um, I would agree that these three from this year have been some of the um, most productive use of this day of demolition, which um, can, can sometimes just feel like we're dragging out the clock. But I think these three demonstrate why the process is written the way that it is, and it, it can come out with a, a number of different solutions that are positive. I agree. So it's time to move on to our first public hearing, item 5A. This is a public hearing in consideration of a landmark alteration certificate application to remove a fence at the property north of 200 Gallardia Lane. And my apologies if I mispronounced that. You guys, we moved here from San Francisco and I keep wanting to say gear Dele Lane in the Chautauqua Historic District pursuant to section 91118 of the Boulder Revised Code 1981 and under the procedures prescribed by chapter 1-3 quasi-judicial hearings, BRC 1981. And I believe Claire is doing this presentation. I am, thank you, Abby. Um, so I will go through the quasi-judicial hearing procedures. All speaking to this item will be sworn in and board members will note any ex parte contacts. Um, I'll give the staff presentation and after that the board may ask questions. The applicant will have up to 10 minutes to present to the board and the board may ask questions. Um, we'll then open the public hearing. After all members of the public have made comments, the applicant may respond to, to anything that was said. And then we'll ask everyone to mute their computers and the board will deliberate. A motion requires an affirmative vote of at least three members to pass and motions must state findings, conclusions and recommendation. A recording of this hearing is available in a couple of days as a video recording and the official record will be added to the records archive within 28 days, usually sooner. Um, so I will pass it back to Abby for ex parte context. Um, the board has requested that we note who reviewed this at the LDRC, and that was Abby, Ronnie, and Marcy. So back to you, Abby. Thank you, Claire. Um, Chelsea, any ex parte contacts? No. John? None. Ronnie? None. And I actually did, I did go to this site and look at it on Monday, May 15th, just prior to the Square Nails 
um, ceremony, award ceremony, um, celebrating National Historic Preservation Month. And there were a few people, um, cottagers and people who um, lived at Chautauqua who were also there when I was looking at the site. So back to you, Claire. Thank you, Abby. So the criteria for review are outlined in the Boulder Revised Code under 9.11.18b and C. This review is to ensure that the pr proposed work preserves, enhances, or restores, and does not damage exterior architectural features of the property, does not adversely affect the historic architectural value of the property, um, the architecture arrangement, texture, color arrangement of color and materials are compatible with the character of the property, and that the Landmarks Board considers the economic feasibility of alternatives, incorporation of energy efficiency design and enhanced access for the disabled. Uh, the options today for the Landmarks Board are to approve the application. This is subject to a 16-day City Council call-up period, um, which we had to extend to the next City Council meeting. So um, if City Council would like to review the application, they will let us know at their August 3rd meeting. Um, the Board um, may also deny the application, which would be subject to a 30-day period in which City Council could request to review the decision. Strangely enough, that also would happen on August 3rd. Um, because this is an after-the-fact review, if the board finds the fence removal to not meet the guidelines and denies the application, the city would require that the chain link fence be reinstalled in the same location, um, and a denial would mean that the applicant could not submit the same application to remove the fence within 12 months. Um, this is the uh, application process so far. In, um, in April, staff received notification from community members that the garden and fence had been removed from the site. Uh, typically, we're tasked with reviewing exterior changes that for landscaping includes fences, retaining walls, and other hardscaping. Uh, so our focus tonight is on the fence that was removed. Um, after we received that notification, the applicant uh, provided a landmark alteration certificate application for the removal of the fence. And this after the fact request was reviewed by the LDRC on May 17th, and at that time referred to the full board for review in a public hearing. And that brings us to today. So the board has received um, comments from members of the public regarding this application, um, comments that were received before the memo um, was posted are included in the packet as attachment B and comments received after the memo was written have been forwarded to the board and will be included in the public record. So uh, this is the property in question. It is located um, just north of Gelardia Lane, which is um, right, sorry, it's east of Gelardia Lane, it's at the terminus of Gelardia Lane, just north of 200 Gelardia Lane, which is the Bachelda Ranch House, and east of uh, Cottage 211. Um, so this map is a bit confusing because no north is pointing down, so to orient you, uh, baseline is down here. Uh, the trails are, um, well, all around really, but the uh, Bluebell Road is here. Um, the dining hall is here and the auditorium here. Um, and this is the Centennial Garden, which you'll see on some of the images. Um, the area under consideration tonight is um, along this pedestrian path here between the, the general store and community house um, next to the box office and cottage 211. It, the site is approximately 25 feet by 30 feet and until recently was surrounded by a four, four foot tall chain link fence. Um, the area also has some mature trees, um, a loose rock border and a, a utility pole. So this area um, was historically part of the Bachelda Ranch. Um, on the uh, top image here from 1907, you can see the, the remnant of, of the orchard uh, that was planted after the ranch was founded in 1882. Um, around uh, 1910, 
you can see that the area was was still open, unfenced. Um, and you can see there was a tent pitched here. Um, in around uh, 1918, uh, the area was planted as a garden and marked with a simple fence. Um, you might not be able to see it in this image, but if you look closely at this one, you can see the wood posts and wires um, in both this one, this image, and the image from uh, around 1925. We're not super sure on the date of this one. This is to the Cottage 211. Um, this is Gayladia Lane, which at the time went all the way through. Um, and, and you can see that this, this is the flower garden with those fence posts and the wire between. Um, so the period of significance for Chautauqua is from 1898 to 1930. And these are the only images um, of the site that we could locate during that period. However, we do have some aerial images from the late 1940s. Um, at this time, Gelardia became a, a cul-de-sac. You can kind of see this car is parked at the end of Gelardia Lane in the 1940s um, and, a, and a footpath. Um, I don't know if it was a formal footpath or a, a desire line was um, ended up here um, across the, the south side of the um, the area in question to Garden Place, which at the time was uh, this this road here, which on this image is this one. So this is the area in question on this image and same here on this image. Um, we found it pretty hard to tell whether the area is fenced, uh, but you can clearly see four mature trees on the site. So it uh, likely was no longer used as a formal flower garden. Uh, garden Place, that, that street that went through on the previous images um, is was here and um, it was removed in uh, or before 1977 and replaced with a, a footpath, which you can see this is the map that was created for the Gage Davis and Associates Reconnaissance Analysis and Historic Significance Assessment in 1977. This is the, the site right here. Um, this, uh, the, the um, Colorado Chautauqua um, National Historic Landmark nomination from 2005 mentions that a uh, low rock retaining wall with landscaping um, were installed installed on the east side of the ranch house, which is is here, and you can see the rock walls on this on this map here. Um, in the 1970s, at the same time, a fenced vegetable garden was planted on the north. Um, so we believe that the that the garden um as it was in the in the 80s was actually planted sometime in the in the 70s unfortunately we don't have a source for that information so we couldn't check it but that's uh that's something that was said in the um nhl nomination from 2005 um and this is the uh this is the map from the cultural landscape assessment from uh 2002 and this shows a uh, fence around part of the property. It actually only goes around three sides. So this was a survey that was done at that time. So this is the uh, this was the garden before the fence was removed. You can see the four foot tall chain link fence um, here. And this is um, the garden. I failed on my uh, on my photograph expedition and uh, did not take a picture from the same angle. So the uh, the um, the power pole is kind of your frame of reference here. Uh, so the fence was here. Oh, and the rock is the same rock, I believe. Um, so this application is specifically for the after the fact removal of the fence. So our staff analysis uh, is based on 9.11.18b and C of the Boulder Revised Code and also the general design guidelines for historic districts and individual landmarks and also the Chautauqua Park Historic District Design Guidelines. 
From our research, we determined that the wood and wire fence shown on photographs from the late teens to the mid-1920s no longer exists. Uh, the chain link fence was installed outside the period of significance, probably in the late 1970s or 1980s, um, although it's uh, shown only on three sides when the area was surveyed in 2002. Um, we also reviewed the Chautauqua Park Historic District design guidelines, which says the lack of distinction between properties should be preserved. Um, property lines should not be defined by fences or landscape material, so the camp character of the park will be preserved. Um, the use of informal landscaping and low fences to control access to Chautauqua Park Historic District and be between cottages will be considered. Um, and also the design guidelines which say that fences could be easily seen through and were built of woven wire, not chain link, wrought iron or painted or opaque stained wood pickets, and that chain link fences um, are generally inappropriate. So uh, as, as the four foot tall chain link fence was added after the 1970s outside the period of significance, staff considered that its removal will help restore and will not damage or destroy the historic character of the district. Um, as the change is consistent with the general design guidelines and the Chautauqua Park Historic District design guidelines, we considered that the removal of the fence does not adversely affect the special character or special historic architectural and value of the property. And staff considers that the chain link fence was incompatible with the character of the landmark property, therefore removal is appropriate. So in summary, um, in this case, the staff considers the removal of the fence appropriate due to the following factors. Um, the wooden wire fence is shown on photographs no longer exists. The chain link fence was installed during um, outside the period of significance, probably in the late 1970s or 80s. Um, and the removal of the fence helps preserve the character of the district and the chain link fences are generally inappropriate. So our recommended motion is for the Landmarks Board to approve the after the fact application to remove the fence. Um, and the removal of the fence will be generally consistent with the purposes of this chapter. It does not damage the historic character of the landmark property or the exterior architectural features of the property. The fence material was incompatible with the character of the historic district and therefore removal is appropriate. And the work does not adversely affect the special character or special historic architectural and value of the landmark property as it is generally consistent with the Chautauqua Park design guidelines and will comply with section 2.6 of the general design guidelines in section 2-11-18b3 of the Boulder Revised Code. So that's the end of the staff presentation. Um, this is a reminder of the next steps in the process. The applicant has up to 10 minutes to present to the board. And the board may ask questions. We'll then hear comments from any member of the community who wishes to speak. Um, the applicant may have additional time to address anything said during public comment. And then the board will ask everyone to mute their computers and will deliberate. Uh, the question in front of the board today is whether the removal of the fence meets the standards for issuance of a landmark alteration certificate. If yes, um, you should approve the application. Uh, conditions may be discussed and added to the approval if needed. If no, deny the application. So, um, Abby, did you want to turn it over to, I think Jason is here from the CCA to present. Yes. Unless is. any, sorry, unless anybody has questions for me, that's the part I missed. It looks like, like Ronnie has his hand up. Oh, yeah. And so does John. All right. Ronnie, John? Maybe I can go first. Um, actually, I failed to mention something. And Lucas, maybe you can help me with this. Um, just going back to the ex parte contact. Um, I just wanted to make it known that I um, was the architect on the cafe pavilion, um, which was recently constructed, um, helped the Pup Chautauqua with as-built drawings for the auditorium some years ago. 
Um, and then also helped with the rest, the construction or the design of the restroom that's on campus and am helping them with a feasibility study for uh, a current project. Um, I do feel like I am capable of uh, reviewing this case, um, but in this particular instance, Lucas, I wonder what your thoughts are on that and if um, you could help direct me on that. Well, yeah, I think I would kind of redirect it back to you and you kind of already touched on this. Do you feel you can set all that aside and be a fair and impartial today and base your decision on the evidence and the law? I definitely do. All right, well, I think in that case, um, it's really up to you if you feel you are comfortable to make this decision and not base it on any other experience you have. I think you can um, remain on the case. So thanks for raising that. Okay. Um, yeah. I have one question. Does does staff have any, I guess, opinion or knowledge about what the purpose of the fence was? Which fence? The original and the the, the one removed. Well, yeah, the original fence, I guess. <laughs> the original fence we're assuming was a uh, um, just a de demarcation. It wouldn't keep anything out, and I think I probably should allow Jason to address the uh, question about the one removed. Okay, that's yeah. I was just wondering if it was deer proofing. Hi everyone. Should I should I get started? Yes, and Jason, if you would kind enough to raise your right hand or and swear you'll tell the board the full truth, and then you may proceed and you'll have 10 minutes. I do. Thanks, everyone. Good evening. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jason Hill. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Colorado Chautauqua Association. I've, I've been with the organization for five years now. Um, I have a few things to say tonight, but I, I don't plan on taking the entire 10 minutes. Um, so I, I wanted to start by saying that, as I'm sure most of you know, um, CCA submits anywhere between five to 10 LACs every year, oftentimes more. And, um, you know, as stewards of, of Boulder's only National Historic Landmark, we take preservation very seriously and work closely with landmark staff to ensure that we are adhering to the guidelines and requirements for maintaining and preserving Chautauqua, which is in constant need of, of care and attention. Um, regarding the fence uh, we're here to discuss tonight, um, despite being very familiar with the LAC process, CCA was, was unaware that an LAC was required to remove the four, -link chain -link, four foot chain link fence. Um, specifically, the administrative review guidelines require review of fencing with the following language, um, rear or side yard fences that are less than five feet high and have a minimum of one inch spacing between pickets. The guidelines imply that approval is needed to remove wooden picket fences under five feet, but they don't necessarily address other types of fencing, including the, the chain link fencing question, which is considered you know, generally inappropriate. We, we understand that level two review covers everything other than what's defined in administrative review, but there's there's still an implication of for wooden fencing. Um, although there are there are no um, other chain link fences at Chautauqua outside of the tennis court area, um, we think it would be helpful if, if, if Landmark's board could clarify their intent regarding fencing of all types for future rent reference. This was definitely a point of confusion for the person responsible for the LAC applications and also confusing for, for leadership, including myself. Um, ha having said that, um, CCA concurs with the landmark staff recommendation to, to retroactively approve removal of the fence. You know, uh, photographs of the property throughout time clearly indicate various uses and that the fence was installed outside of the period of significance. Um, and that, you know, its removal does, does, is not detrimental to the historic character of the district as the chain link fences are, are, are considered inappropriate. And we see that a lot in our, our design guidelines. Um, 
Uh, you know, uh, this hearing is specifically about the fence removal. Um, I think it's important to address some of the comments that you've received about the garden itself and to be to be clear about the facts. Uh, CCA had had CCA taken the actions we were being accused of taken um, by those who have written to you and, and probably speaking tonight, we, we could certainly understand why those people would be upset. We did not, however, destroy the garden. We removed the fence surrounding the garden and were, in fact, careful not to destroy plant material within the garden itself. This was a perennial flower garden, an annual vegetable garden, encompassing a relatively small area, and that started sometime from what we can understand the 1980s. Um, it's also to, I think, import, important to address claims that the garden was historic, as described in detail in the packet prepared by Landmark staff tonight, the space in question has had a variety of uses over many decades, including during the period of significance, and was not, from our view, considered historic at the time of the fence removal. And I don't, I think that that's the sentiment that I'm hearing from staff as well. Nor is it considered a historic feature in CCA's NHL application outside of the boulder wall that's constructed and constructed in front of Cottage 200, nor is it mentioned in the cultural landscape assessment and plan and um, Chautauqua's design guidelines. These are governing documents that we visit daily and that help guide our work. Um, despite the fact that the garden is not a historic feature of the property, CCA does intend to maintain the space as a garden and is proposing to make it publicly accessible, um, a demonstration garden for firewise and native plants that will serve as a space for, for research development, outreach, educational opportunities. Um, we have drawn some preliminary plans. Uh, we will be submitting them to the Building and Grounds Committee at Chautauqua, as we always do, for review before bringing them to the full Landmarks Board for final approval in the coming months. Um, lastly, I, I'd like to reiterate what I believe most of you know to be true. Um, the CCA Staff at CCA are, are diligent stewards of Chautauqua. We are professionals, many in the field of historic preservation, who um, understand our commitment to maintaining and preserving this historic property and work collaborative, collaboratively with landmark staff to ensure that we are meeting our obligations. Um, just this year, we received a Landmarks Project Award for the construction of the Chautauqua Cafe. And one of our longtime employees received a Lifetime Achievement Award for his work in the preservation community. Um, for anyone to suggest that we do not care about preservation is disappointing, to say the least, and, and not supported by the facts. Um, I, I also, final, final, I wanted to um, thank city staff for their collaborative and comprehensive approach to navig navigating this LAC and, and so many others in the past. We, we greatly value our relationship and rely on their guidance as we continue to care for what is truly a national treasure and, and the crown jewel of Boulder. Um, this concludes my comments um, on the LAC before you tonight. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions you may have now or um, during the discussion period. Thank you, Jason. Um, do any board members have questions of Jason before we proceed to public comment? I mean, this is Lucas. I was actually going to return to that conversation with Ronnie a little bit. I had a chance to look at a, a little bit more at the code of conduct. And Ronnie, um, did you say that you had, uh, are you currently an independent contractor working with uh, the Chautauqua Association? Yes. Okay, I think in that case, um, I'm, and I'm going to read something from the code here. Um, if I can find my, my right screen. But um, the, an employment relationship, um, the definition of that includes an independent contractor relationship. And one of the prohibitions in the code is to use, um, for a public official to use his or her public position to obtain a benefit for the official or employee. And the list goes on to state, or anyone with whom the official or employee has a business or employment relationship. So I think in this case, since you do have an ongoing uh, contractual relationship with the applicant, I would recommend that you recuse from this one. Okay, that makes sense. I'll recuse myself. Thank you for the clarification. All right, thanks, Ronnie. 
And do we want to identify someone who can let Ronnie know when to return to the meeting? We certainly can, yeah. If whatever is the most convenient <laughs> context. Yeah, I, I will. Um, I will let you know, Ronnie. Thank, Thank you, Marcy. You. I I realized I don't have like Ronnie on my speed dial or anything. Thank you, Marcy. And um, that being said, that. Um, with three of us um, who will deliberate after we hear from public comment. And Jason, you will obviously have an additional time to respond to anything. It will take um, a unanimous vote of three, depending on any motions that might be brought forward. Before we want to, before we start public comment, I just want to give a shout out to Chautauqua's 125th birthday celebration and how the weather cooperated and everything. So congratulations, you guys, on a remarkable um, milestone. So let's do move to public comment. And you can either raise your hand or press star nine on your phone if you wish to speak to this item. We will be swearing in every speaker and you will have three minutes to speak. And I don't know who is seeing who is interested from the public to address this issue. Oh, Marcy, hello again. Okay. Hi again. Okay, so um, as a reminder, if you'd like to speak, you need to display your full name and use that raise hand function down in the menu. Um, so we have four people, Abby, um, who have their hand raised, um, starting with Pat Shanks, followed by Star Warren. Uh, thank you, Marcy. And Pat, if you will state your full name and swear to tell the board the full truth, your three minutes will then commence. Uh, yes, my name is Pat Shanks, and um, I do swear to tell the truth. And um, I'm a member of the Chautauqua Board of Directors, and um, I'm also um, the co chair of what's been called for the last year, the Preservation, Sustainability and Resilience Committee, which includes the functions of what's known as building and grounds and sustainability and resilience. And um, we tried an experiment this year combining those boards and we're gonna split them back up to separate boards. And uh, starting in September, I'll be chair of sustainability and resilience. But anyway, this board um, was ha has its own design review committee that examines applications to the Landmarks Board for Chautauqua um, before those are submitted. And so um, I definitely will second what Jason said about taking Landmarks applications seriously. And um, what I just, uh, what I want to say and emphasize really is that the only thing that was done to the garden area is the removal of the non-conforming chain link fence. And uh, we agree with the staff recommendation on that. And the garden, as Jason mentioned, will, will continue as a garden. It will be repurposed with a new dimension. And Sustainability and Resilience at Chautauqua, that committee that I chair, is, um, as you might imagine, super concerned about fire danger and fire resilience. And um, uh, we've been working for years to improve defensive space, remove under, under uh, brush and stuff like that, and um, planting fire resistant materials is really important in this demonstration garden will be really helpful for that. So um, I, I urge you to approve this application uh, for the removal of the fence and we will move forward with a discussion at the building and grounds committee in the near future for exactly what kind of arrangement the new garden will have and uh, 
any other things that come up with regard to that that require landmarks approval will be brought to, to you guys. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Star is next, I believe you said, Marcy. And Star, welcome this evening. And if you would um, swear to tell the board the full truth before you commence, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you for letting me have a chance to speak. Um, my name is Star Waring, and I do swear to tell the entire truth, um, the whole truth and nothing but the truth um, to, the, um, to the board. Um, I do want to go on record as saying that I agree with the staff recommendation to approve this application, and I completely agree with the facts that were laid out, and also those um, items that were mentioned by Jason and by Pat. And um, just in addition to that, I would add that um, I, you know, I think that the reason that the purpose of the existing space is being changed completely aligns with Chautauqua's mission, with one of which is education. And the use of this space as a garden demonstration space for firewise plants and um, water-wise plants is totally in keeping with that mission. And that, that's important. Um, that's not really related to why the fence was removed. The fence was removed, I think, for very legitimate reasons. But it is important to keep in mind that this space, even though it wasn't historically always a garden within the period in, uh, in question, um, I think will serve a broader purpose than it has in the past. And, and does align with Chautauqua's mission. So um, those are my comments on it. Again, as chair of the board, I think the staff has been remarkable in the way it's, uh, it's handled uh, the application process and the adherence to preservation and uh, historical, of historical uh, matters. So, we want to thank you again for giving us the time to make a presentation. So thank you. Thank you so much, Star, for joining us this evening. Marcy, the next two speakers. Jen Marcus, followed by Georgia, Georgia Chamberlain. And if there's anyone else who's interested in speaking to this item, um, go ahead and use the raise hand function. OK, so Jen. Jan, we will be swearing you in and then your three minutes will begin. Okay, thank you. I swear to tell the truth. Um, my name is Jen Marcus. I'm a real estate agent in Boulder. I also will mention that I grew up in Chautauqua Cottage 108 and I'm the daughter of Carrie and Ben Gilbert. I'm requesting that the Landmarks Board deny the retroactive LAC application for the following reasons. CCA is denying the historical significance of the garden that existed on this site because it benefits them to do so. The area where the garden existed prior to its destruction, I'll mention the garden itself was destroyed, not just the fence. It was established in 1917, as we saw in the photo, so its very tenure on landmark grounds should be considered of historic significance. Many members of the CCA staff and some Chautauqua board members insist that the garden was not removed or destroyed, only the fence. Photos prove otherwise. They've been submitted to the landmark office. The garden was destroyed without proper process, community input, or submittal for review by the Chautauqua Board of Directors, let alone the landmark's office. This act effectively undermined landmark's office prematurely. The gardens of Chautauqua overall have been an important part of the unique history, beauty, and cultural appeal, and maintaining them is critical for the cultural residency, and environmental benefit of the area for all visitors. Clearly, this plot of land has far more value to the entire community than a chain link fence, that it was part of the Chautauqua history, landmark grounds, and cultural preservation of Chautauqua. The actions of CCA staff has struck a particular chord with the entire cottager community, some board members, and many Boulder citizens. CCA staff and the CCA board have received numerous letters of outrage over this action, 
one of which was signed by many former Chautauqua board members. It is apparent that the CCA never had a clear plan in place prior to removing the garden and that they have applied for retroactive approval for doing so after sidestepping proper protocol and only after being called out for failing to do so. Anyone who owns an historic home or lives in an historic district in Boulder has navigated the complexity of applying to landmarks for alterations or updates to their properties. CCA should be held to the same standards as any other applicant. To accept this LAC retroactively sets a dangerous precedent, not only for the Chautauqua community, but for all homeowners of historic landmark properties in Boulder. It becomes a ask for forgiveness first and permission later situation. Chautauqua is far more than a plot of land with historic structures. It is a treasured time honored culture and a community and the preservation of the land, the environment and the structures only hold significance when a community and culture can benefit and thrive as a result of careful and intentional preservation and proper stewardship. I conclude by requesting that the Landmarks Board reject this LAC and require CCA to restore what they have destroyed. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And I apologize, Marcy, the next speaker was? Uh, Georgia Chamberlain, followed by Trudy Turvey. Okay. So, Georgia, again, please um, swear to tell the board the truth and then you may begin. Well, good evening, I'm Georgia Chamberlain, owner of cottage number two in Chautauqua Park. And I swear to tell the truth this evening. The issue in front of landmarks tonight goes deeper than just a retroactive application for an alteration certificate for a chain link fence that has already been removed. The don't ask for permission, ask for, for forgiveness behavior of the Chautauqua, Colorado Chautauqua Association shows disrespect to the landmarks board to their purpose and to the hard work of the board members. And it also threatens the preservation of Chautauqua Park. To award an alteration certificate after the blatant disregard by CCA for the rules and procedures would set a dangerous precedent. I encourage the Landmarks Board to find out why the organization that has been entrusted with the preservation of Chautauqua Park, Boulder's most iconic historic site, continuously chooses to ignore rules and procedures that have been in place for many years. In a short period of time this spring, CCA tore down a fence without following proper procedures, constructed the fence behind the dining hall using a plan that had been denied by landmarks and also publicly gave erroneous information to landmarks as to the mention by CCA of a greenhouse as an alternative to the historic garden. I'm referring to the April 24th CCA meeting when the greenhouse possibility was mentioned and then at the May 17th landmarks meeting when CCA denied that a greenhouse was ever considered. It is difficult to trust that CCA will follow the rules in the future and that they will give landmarks good information on which to base your decisions. Also, I encourage landmarks to give consideration for including gardens in their preservation determinations. I acknowledge and thank all the board members and staff for their hard work. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. And um, finally, we have Trudy Turvey. And if there's anyone else who's interested in speaking, go ahead and uh, raise your hand at this time. Hey, welcome, Trudy, and I think you know what I'm going to ask you to do after you state your full name before you begin. I think I can manage. Thank, Thank you so much. Uh, Trudy Turvey, and I swear to tell the truth. Uh, I am the vice chair of the CCA board, have been involved with Chautauqua for at least four years now. And as I know it, this issue is about the fence and the fence itself from the landmark boards due diligence has been shown to not be part of 
the historic nature of Chautauqua. Some of the things that have been said have been untrue from my standpoint. Chautauqua staff are dedicated to preserving Chautauqua and they have a very good relationship with the Landmark Board. This endeavor was really a reading of the rules as uh, they exist now. And they don't seem to cover this chain leak fence in my mind. And I think that Jason has spoken to that. And perhaps that is something the Landmark Board needs to look at. But in no way does Chautauqua attempt to go around the Landmark Board. They've been very faithful in applying to you and seeking guidance for anything that they have tried to do. I think that for many people, this issue is beyond the fence, which is why some of the comments have been made. We have actually already reached out to at least one cottage member for input on possible plans. I think that CCA tries very hard to be collaborative. Reinstalling the fence to me does not seem to be an appropriate thing to do at this point. And nor did it serve a great purpose. Anyhow, as your own uh, staff has shown, it was not part of the historic significance. So I would urge you to accept their recommendation for this application. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time, Trudy. Marcy, um, do you wanna give, do you see any additional hands raised? This will be a final call for anyone um, else who would like to speak under public comment. Seeing none, I think Abby, that concludes the public comment portion. Okay, we will now close the public hearing for agenda item 5A this evening. We will bring it back to board discussion. I ask that everyone else mute your computer or phone and for the Abby, so so sorry. Um, the applicant does have a chance to respond to anything that was said during the public comment. Jason, my apologies. I apologize. You do have an additional three minutes if you'd like to respond to anything you heard. Thanks, Abby. Um, you know, I, I don't have much to say. Um, I, I will say that um, it's disappointing um, to hear some of those comments. Um, I think it's pretty obvious that, um, you know, my stance is that um, those comments, a lot of what you heard is, is not true. And I tried to lay out the facts. I think that um, staff from the city did a great job of that to begin with and um part of the reason why I, I didn't need very much time to to comment on this um um the fact that the cca staff has misled anyone um in, in reference to the greenhouse is I, I don't understand there's we have a few ideas about how this space could um could um succeed in in the new vision that exists but we're nowhere near uh of any sort of final recommendation at all we'll work through the process and, and talk to um the appropriate um entities as we work through it so um um you know that's that's all i have to say um and um i'm happy to answer any any further questions um that you all might have thank you jason and Marcy, thank you for um, reminding me I missed that very vital step in tonight's hearing. So if, if board members have no additional questions for Jason, we will move on to our board discussion. I do ask that everyone mute your, everyone else mute your computer or phone for the duration. We have allotted approximately 30 minutes for this discussion, but we'll take the time we need to do that. And, Aubrey, I know you're keeping um, a time check on us, and if you would be kind enough to do that. I don't know if John or Chelsea, if either one of you want to kick off this discussion. Well, did, did we get a chance to ask questions of staff or? Yes. I mean, Marcy asked that earlier after presentation, but go uh -huh. ahead. 
Go ahead, please. Well, it's always, it's always, I always feel like I always have questions after I hear everything. Um, so, <laughs> um, I guess I, I don't have any questions about the fence. I think that it's approvable to remove the fence if this, obviously, things happen, people misinterpret the rules they are very complicated with this issue. I don't think we would have had any issues approving the removal of the fence. Um, I just wanna get clarification for myself and for the public because I'm still confused about the issue of the garden. Is that something that is under our jurisdiction as the Landmarks Board at, at all? I, I can answer that question um, and thank you for it. So um, the landscaping guidelines and what's in our purview um, for landscaping includes things like uh, retaining walls and fences and um, the removal of mature trees. But we don't review what people plant in those spaces, whether it's a house in a historic district or up at Chautauqua. So the plantings themselves are not in our purview. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's very helpful. And I think that that's helpful for the people who are here asking for us to remedy an issue um, that it's not under our purview to remedy that issue, um, fortunately or unfortunately. So I think we should stick to the topic of the fence. And I believe according to the guidelines and um, the information in the memo that we should approve the, um, what's in the memo. Okay. Um, I concur completely with what Chelsea just said. I think that, I think that as, as brought to us, our task tonight is to look at the fence. Um, chain link is an, inappropriate fence type in a lot of environments, historical environments that we look at, and um, definitely so here. Um, the issue of the garden, the only, I guess the only question I have is, is the garden there now? Is the plant material there now, other than possibly the annual plant material that didn't get planted this year? Just to clarify that point. Um, and that's to Jason, I guess. Sure. So um, as you, you could see from some of the photos in the application that at the time of the removal of the fence, the perennial plants that were there at the removal of the fence were there. We did reach out to the gentleman that um, was tending to the garden and asked if he wanted to remove any of those plants, um, including the irises and some rhubarb that was there. And he did choose to do that. So um, we allow that to happen and he, he removed the irises from the garden. Um, the other side of the garden was um, annual plant material for the most part. There's some sunflowers that are still there. Um, but the answer to your question is yes, after the removal of the fence, we carefully remove the fence to, so as to not disturb the plant material that is in there. Um, but since then, one of the um, uh, community members um, was asked if you want to remove and, and chose to, to do so. Okay. I mean, that was, I just wanted a clarification there because it's been, this has been batted back and forth as to the state of the garden and, and its destruction. It's outside of our purview to say anything about a garden, even if it is a historic garden. We don't have code that really allows us to visit that, as Marcy just said. There's been instances when I wished we did. Um, so the fence, removal of the fence is approvable. Um, we can understand confusion as to how these kind of processes go in a district and how they are supposed to come to us. In terms of Jason, in terms of your question about guidance on fences generally in Chautauqua, that's, I guess, something for um, for your group to take up with staff um, because there is um, a pretty good set of guidelines 
at the general level and probably specific guidelines for the Chautauqua community about what fencing would be appropriate and what would not. I don't think any kind of barrier type of fence would be appropriate there because the guidelines state that the openness of the territory and the and the I guess um, the continuity of it is part of the historic character. So you don't want to put up stockade fences and that type of thing. But open, visually open and um, historically consistent fencing, like something like split rail or or picket or something in certain areas may be appropriate. But that's something that you should take up and get a little more depth on. So I'm I'm supporting the approval. Thank you, John. And <laughs> my apologies for losing my voice. Um, you know, this this is and Jason, you 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 said the words as did several other speakers tonight. You know, this is the crown jewel of Boulder. It is a national historic landmark. It's it's um, beloved by everybody, a real yeah. treasure. And, you know, perhaps we love it too much to death. And this is a hard one for me because, you know, as Chautauqua evolves and makes changes it needs to and explores things not only for you know, fire mitigation and all of that. You know, I'm always cognizant that sometimes with a place as special at Chautauqua, an incremental change is one thing, but collectively sometimes could a variety of incremental changes lead us to something that's not there. And, and I do know that people who work there care about it. I also know that the cottagers care about it as well. And, you know, no one has a monopoly on that. And I, I do think this is unfortunate because um, I think Chelsea and John have gotten to the heart of the matter based on staff's excellent memo and presentation that our purview, even if we had documentation, this was a historic garden. And there's certainly old photographs that, sh that show during the period of significance, this space was used as a garden. And, you know, I have to realize that really our purview is the chain link fence. I also think for everybody who's listening to this and took the time and energy to write emails and letters, um, when this was looked at at the LDRC, we didn't have as much information as staff was able to pull together for a full landmark sport hearing. That's the way it happens. And I think that sometimes where there ever is a question, because I understand this never went to brown, grounds and building committee, is that you know maybe always err on the side to see if you need an LAC. And it really comes from a place where you know our task is to protect things and especially something as as remarkable as Chautauqua I I you know it's also not under our purview to help sort of navigate some issues or miscommunications between the CCA board and cottagers or other members of the community who care deeply about this place so um as I I think I join my colleagues uh Chelsea and John in supporting because our focus has to be on is the chain link fence appropriate and since it's not no matter how long it has been there um, and become part of the fabric of that area um, we do need to support the retroactive landmark alteration certificate this evening and I don't know if there's any more discussion, if we have a board member who'd like to make a motion. Sure, I'll make a motion. Um, whatever, okay. I move that the Landmarks Board adopt the staff memorandum dated July 12, 2023 as the findings of the board and approve a landmark alteration certificate to remove a fence at the property north of 200 I'm going to forget Gaylardia Lane in the Chautauqua Park Historic District, finding that the proposal meets the standards for issuance of a landmark alteration certificate in Chapter 9 11 18 BRC 1981 
and is generally consistent with the general design guidelines in the Chautauqua Park Historic District guidelines. Thank you, Chelsea. I will second that. Thank you, John. So on a motion by Chelsea, seconded by John, we will take a roll call vote unless there's any additional comments. And Mark, I wanna give you an opportunity. If there's anything you'd like to add. No, I, I have nothing to add. Thank you. I'm, I'm in support of uh, the motion. Thank, thank you, Mark. So on a roll call vote, Chelsea? Aye. John? Aye. And I vote aye, so the motion does pass unanimously. And then, um, Marcy, I assume the next step for this retroactive LAC is to... I think Claire will go through those. Yep. Oh, thank uh you, Claire. Thank you. Oh. Thank you always forget that I'm here. I'm still here. <laughs> the, um, so City Council usually has 16 days to decide uh, whether to review um, or call up the decision. Um, as the next City Council meeting is on August 3rd, um, we've requested, um, we'll request an extension. Um, and then, so if the City Council does not call up for review at this time, um, the LAC will be approved. Um, and if the City Council does want to review the decision, staff will schedule a hearing within 45 days of today. So that will happen on August 3rd. That wasn't very clear. Does anybody have any questions about that? It was clear to me. Thank you, Claire. Okay, good. All right, Abby, are we ready to, uh, to move on? Yes, so um, Marcy, will you reach out to Ronnie? Um, yes, I have. And okay. um, if uh, someone could promote Ronnie to a panelist, I think we'll then be ready to get started. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you. There we go. Looks like Ronnie's back, so we're ready to move on. So, thank you, Ronnie. <laughs> item 5C on our agenda, since item 5B has been postponed, is a public hearing to consider adopting a resolution to initiate the process for landmark designation of 1918 Pine Street, pursuant to section 911.3 of the Boulder Revised Code 1981. The owner is Benjamin Oliver and the applicant is the City of Boulder Landmarks Board who voted to hold this initiation hearing this evening. All right, thank you, Abby. I will do this presentation also. Um, this initiation hearing is legislative in nature, so the procedure is slightly different than the quasi-judicial hearing. Um, the board does not need to reveal any uh, ex parte contacts. Uh, the rest of the hearing is somewhat similar. I'll give the staff presentation. After that, the board may ask questions. Um, the applicant um, we'll have 10 minutes to present to the board and the board may ask questions. We'll then open the public hearing. After all members of the public have made comments, um, the applicant may respond to anything that was said. And then we'll ask everyone to mute their computers and the board will deliberate. A motion today requires an affirmative vote of at least three members to pass and motions will state findings, conclusions and recommendation. A record of this hearing is um, again available in a couple of days as a video recording and the official record will be added to the records archive within 28 days. The criteria for the initiation review is in 9113D. Um, the first items in 9113D refer back to 9111 and 9112 to outline the purposes and standards used to determine if the board has probable cause to believe that the building or district might be eligible for designation as an individual landmark. Um, in addition, 9113D directs the board to review the application based on whether there are currently resources available to complete outreach and analysis. If 
There is community and neighborhood support if the building needs the protections provided through designation, if the proposed designation is consistent with the goals and policies of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, or if the proposed designation would generally be in the public interest. Um, as 9113D is legislative, uh, the board can consider any of the information heard. So the board has two options tonight uh, because the demolition application is withdrawn and the stay is ended. Um, the board cannot approve the demolition application because it's been withdrawn. So uh, option one, the board may vote to not initiate designation um, and the case will be closed. Um, a decision today to not initiate does not affect a future decision. So designation may be um, initiated at a future date. Uh, for example, if full demolition was proposed in the future, the process would follow the same demolition review process and could end up at this same point. Um, or uh, option two, the board may vote to initiate designation and a future hearing will be held. So this has been the process so far. The board placed a stay of demolition at the hearing on uh, April 12th. Um, on June 7th, the Landmarks Board voted to schedule a, a hearing to initiate landmark designation or issue a demolition permit. On June 28th, the owner withdrew the application for full demolition. Um, the Landmarks Board is the applicant for the initiation, so although the demolition application was withdrawn, the initiation hearing still needed to be held tonight. Um, although, as I mentioned, this does change the board's options. So uh, nine, uh, 1918 Pine is um, located mid block between 19th and 20th streets. The front of the building faces north onto Pine Street. And the building is located within the identified potential Whittier Historic District, which is shown here in green. Uh, it is a one story masonry house, uh, was constructed around 1887. Um, it has a front gable uh, with the um, the gable ends here constructed of brick uh, with the wide uh, wooden barge boards and has a full width um, porch supported by wooden posts. Uh, this is the rear of the house, which includes a shed roof addition uh, constructed sometime between 1900 and 1906. There are also two accessory buildings on the site uh, proposed for, um, sorry, that are included in the uh, the initiation of landmark designation. Um, the older accessory building is a one-story frame garage with a gable roof and shed roof additions uh, on the west and north sides. And the other accessory building is a one-story frame building with a shed roof. So some of the building history, um, Amos Widner actually owned the land in 1874. Uh, Widner is important to Boulder's history as in 1872, he and Granville Barclay proposed extending the official city limits eastward from 17th Street. Um, Widner sold the land in 1877 and we don't know if the house was built at that time, but it does appear on the 1887 Willits map. Um, William and Harriet Rowan and son Freeman were the first residents and are listed in the 1892 city directory and on the 1900 federal census at this location. Uh, William was a minor. The family moved to the adjacent property about 1911 and rented 1918 Pine Street. Uh, the son Fremont sold the house in 1927 and it was owned by a variety of owners who rented it out. Um, Mary Ann Hogan Clinky purchased the house in 1953 and lived there until 1985. Mary Ann's estate sold the house in 1985 to John Emmerich, who sold the house to the current owner. Uh, staff considers that the building has historic and architectural significance and that the building and area have historic integrity. As such, the building would be eligible for individual landmark designation based on the criteria outlined in 9111 and 9112. However, probable cause, which addresses whether the building could be designated, uh, is only one of the items the board should consider to identify if the building should be designated. 
uh, 9.11.3 asks whether there are staff resources for outreach and analysis and staff resources are currently limited. Um, also, if there's community support, which has been limited and whether the building needs the protections provided through designation. And as there is no current demolition application, the demolition approval would not be issued if the board takes no action to initiate designation. So therefore the building does not need the protections provided through designation at this time. The board is also asked to consider if initiation over the owner's objection represents a reasonable balance between private property rights and the public's interest and is consistent with the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Uh, we consider that, the, that designating this property over the owner's objection would not represent a reasonable balance between private property rights and the public's interest. Uh, because there is uh, there's no current demolition threat to the property, um, staff does not recommend initiating designation over the owner's objection. So that's the end of the staff presentation. Um, this is a reminder of the next steps in the process. Uh, the applicant has up to 10 minutes to present to the board, but I don't believe he is attending tonight. Um, we will follow that by uh, public participation and um, an opportunity um, for the applicant if he is here to respond to anything that's been said and then board deliberation. Thank you, Claire. And um, Ben is here if um, okay. someone can go ahead and promote him. I don't think he's planning to do a full presentation, but we do want to give him the opportunity um, to speak if he wishes. Thank you for noticing that, Marcy. Uh, so just a reminder, the question in front of the board today is whether the board should initiate landmark designation. Uh, if yes, we will schedule a Landmarks Board designation hearing within 60 to 120 days, followed by City Council review. If not, the process ends. Any questions from the board before I hand it over to Ben? Yes, John. Um, could, could staff, I guess, address briefly the current state of discussion about the Whittier um, designation of Whittier as a district? Marcy, that's on you. I have no idea. <laughs> just um, briefly, just. Yeah, John, I am not aware of an active um, interest or movement to designate um, the Whittier neighborhood as a historic district. It was or has been identified as potentially eligible for over 40 years. Um, but, you know, I, I am not aware of a current kind of interest or movement um, to create a historic district there. Okay. That's helpful. Chelsea. Chelsea. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the conversations that led to the decision for them, for the owners to remove or to withdraw. Yeah, happy to. So um, uh, we met on site the day after the last Landmarks Board meeting in June. Um, Abby was there along with staff. And um, the owner and as, as a group, we walked around the property. The building um, itself is really old um, and was originally the brick um, gable roof. And then there were some early additions kind of tacked onto the back. And then the accessory buildings, which were which were built later, and through those discussions about um, potentially removing the later additions, um, not considering the uh, accessory buildings to be particularly um, special, the owner um, proposed to withdraw and then revise the application to be a partial demolition because of the way the lot is set up um, and where the building is located. When you remove those older additions, you can actually build kind of a sizable addition, but still be compatible with the older building. Um, and I think um, to his credit, Ben, the owner was very open to alternatives um, throughout this process and, and was willing to keep the, the building and work with it. Um, of course, I don't want to speak for him. So um, you might also repeat your question for him uh, once he's spoken. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much for the context. Yeah. 
Any other questions from the board? Okay, then I would say <clears throat> move on to the applicant's presentation, or the owner in this case. So welcome, Ben. Um, we don't have to swear you in for this legislative hearing, but um, you would have up to 10 minutes for anything you'd like to share with the board. Ben, if you're trying to speak with us, you are currently yep. muted. There we go. There you go. And you, Do you hear me you now? You use your camera too. Yep, we sure can. Sorry, but yeah, I just saw the thing pop up. I um, I just want to say I appreciate what you're doing as a historic, you know, preservation effort. I know that you know I've, I've owned this house for over thirty years. I understand the significance of history and of Boulder history. And it's it's just a little. It's just been a it's just been a funny process. It's like we're thinking about this house is you know beyond its life expectancy. There's there's nothing great there as a building uh, perspective to preserve. Yet, I get I get what we're doing here. I get history. I get Boulder. I, I just from a you know materials standpoint. Um, we're working with a bunch of aged out materials and I want to, I want to do something here for this property that somebody's going to live in, in the future. And, um, and so through this process, we're starting this building project with a bunch of, you know, 150 year old materials. And so be it, you know, that's, that's just, it is what it is. And, and we can work, we can work with that. So I, I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just curious what, you know, what the, what the point is exactly of, of saving the old stuff and starting with that compared to the, the, um, you know, with just working with more appropriate current materials that's that's i guess my question that i come up with in this but i don't know o overall we're gonna we're gonna get this done we're gonna figure it out um i'm gonna do you know something there because because right now the house is it's old it's falling apart like it's it's really not livable as is and i want to do something there and so we'll we'll figure out what that thing is but I just just wanted to say thanks for your uh, thanks for your input, thanks for your efforts. That's about all. Thank you, Ben, and we will give you an opportunity if you choose to speak after any um, comments made by members of the public. And we will move on to public comment now. Please raise your hand or press star nine if you're on the phone if you would like to speak to this item. We'll give everyone a couple um, minutes here to uh, go ahead and raise their hand if they'd like to speak to this item. Um, currently, I'm not seeing anyone who has indicated they would like to speak. There we go. We have one um, person who would like to speak. Um, first up is Lynn Siegel. So this is 1918 Pine, right? Yeah. Yes, Lynn. Yeah, um, I, Jonathan Cohen just texted me about the Environmental Advisory Board meeting. I don't know why they all have to happen at the same night, but, you know, environmentally, um, I say that this house is a whole lot better excuse to be in the landfill than 70, 770 Circle. A three story, be, you know, like beautifully accommodated. Less than a third of the house was added and was subservient to the rest of the place. There's no excuse for that house being demoed. This house 
you turn around and uh, with this house, it really probably could be demoed, you know, or maybe one face of it, you know, a partial demolition like you were talking about. But I just don't understand. I don't get it. You knock down a fortress that has tons of historical value. And then a guy like this, and a guy like the one on Mariposa, you know, what gives? There's no sense to it. You know, and you know, I come to these meetings every week to LDRC. I come to every landmark meeting for years, years. And I don't see your logic. And I, I can understand what this guy's saying. You know, you should let him demo the place. Frankly. But 770 Circle, you're never going to live that down. Never. There's no excuse for that. I don't care what you told me, Marcy, that. Yeah, well, that was that you've been told many times. No, I haven't been told. I don't have any idea how that house was demoed. That does not make any sense at all. This house, let it go. Give the guy a friggin' break. Seriously. You have no consistency in how you operate. You're not trustable. And I'm paying for it. It's my tax dollars. So start doing the right thing. Done. Thank you, Lynn. Marcy, have you seen any, excuse me, additional raised hands? Um, no, I've not seen any additional raised hands. So this will be the final call. If there's anyone who would like to speak to 1918 Pine, um, go ahead and raise your hand now. Otherwise, um, Abby, I believe um, we are ready to um, move on. Okay, so we will um, close public comment for this particular hearing. Ben, if you'd like an additional three minutes or any other comments, you're welcome to make them at this time. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm good. Thanks. Okay, th thank you. So we will move on to board deliberation. I ask that everyone else mute your phone or computer for the duration of this discussion. Audrey will be keeping kind of a time check on for us. And I don't know if there's a board member who'd like to kick off the conversation for this hearing. I can do it. Thank if you, John. Nobody else jumps in. Um, first off, I'd, I'd like to thank um, Ben Oliver for um, his, I guess, agreement with procedure and all here and um, accepting to try to understand what what happens in these proceedings. I, I think I clearly agree with with staff's recommendation that we don't take any action that's consistent with the way we've behaved with these things previously. Um, not to advance designation after the building is, I guess, out of danger to to try to give Ben a little bit of an answer into what it is that we think he's dealing with here or what is the right way to do this. Um, I've, I've said it many times. Um, it, it's kind of a personal thing that I have a problem with demolition, at least has it as it has occurred previously. I don't have a problem with the concept of removing something that has outlived its life and usefulness. But if there's any chance of preserving the life of a building, 
it seems to me that it's the intended thing that buildings live on beyond their initial purpose um, by kind of the process of being manipulated, um, learning as it were. There was a book called How Buildings Learn about instances in say European cities where buildings that are four or 500 years old are renovated internally and structurally in ways to continue their life and be utilized as sometimes fabulous properties. Um, and just from a simple, I guess, environmental ecological standpoint, the building that's still standing there is inducing a lot less environmental impact than if it is removed and replaced. The part of the building that you can preserve, um, the exterior parts are going to be things that don't wind up in the landfill or otherwise release carbon. So it's, it's I think, the right answer in this case, especially if there is an option to partially demolish and to expand the property to a different order of usefulness um, and utility. So um, support not doing anything, but encourage Ben to, um, I guess, involve himself with this process a little bit and definitely get some input from staff which has a massive amount of uh, knowledge to contribute to this and to the rest of the board thank you john ronnie or chelsea Chelsea, would you like me to go? Sure. Um, yeah, I also am in agreement with staff. I think the particular piece to note is that the house is no longer in threat of demolition. Um, and I appreciate John's um, bringing, John bringing up the um, point of consistency in an approach to working on uh, homes uh, like this and reviews like this. Um, and so I'm in, I'm in agreement with the staff recommendation. Yeah, I think um, I'm, I agree um, with the staff recommendation. It feels like a compromise that gets us closer to um, the goals of the landmarks forward and program and also can meet the needs of the applicant. So I, it does sound like obviously the applicant would have chosen to demolish. It, that's what it sounded like from his testimony. Um, so I, yeah, I guess there was some convincing that that was the, um, that this approach was the best approach, um, but not necessarily the one he would have chosen. Um, but ultimately, that's what's in front of us. And I um, think it's approvable. So that's it. Thank you, Chelsea. So first and foremost, I want to thank you, Ben, for, for flying halfway across the country to meet with us on June 8th. And um, I want to thank you for your stewardship of not only 1918 Pine Street, but this the house you own to the west of it. And for those of you who don't know this, and Claire and, and Aubrey and Marcy and I got to see this, 
uh, Ben is a very, very talented woodworker and has done some cool things inside the property. But I think that your willingness to explore creative alternatives to demolition and withdrawing this application um, makes me comfortable with supporting staff's recommendation. I do think this house is ele eligible for individual landmark, but at this point with no threat of demolition and the fact that that may not be something you wanna pursue at this time. Although I do appreciate um, the case Marcy made to you when we visited on site um, of some of the, the definite distinct advantages of landmark um, designation and tax credits and so forth it it seemed like that was something you were willing to at least think about you know we also had that opportunity to talk about an adu and so forth so i just felt like your openness to to where we were coming from why we saw it as important and you know it just adds such a grace note to that street and that neighborhood and just some of the wonderful things you have done to it both um on the exterior ex exterior and interior. I just want to thank you again for that stewardship. So um, I do think staff's recommendation is the route we should go with this. And it sounds like my colleagues on the board are in agreement. I don't know if Mark, you have any comments, if there's any more um, discussion or deliberation, um, or if somebody is willing to make a motion at this time. Abby, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. I've been following along and I seems like I know where we're going and I concur. Thanks. Okay. Just wanted to give that get that out there. Ronnie. I will make a motion. I move that the landmarks board adopt the staff memorandum dated July 12th, 2023 as the findings of the board and not initiate the process for landmark designation for 1918 Pine Street, finding that the property does not meet the criteria for such initiation pursuant to section 911-3 initiation of designation for individual landmarks in historic districts of the Boulder Revised Code 1981 and in balance is not consistent with the goals and policies of section 227 of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Don. Um, Marcy, I and Claire, I do have a question about this because um, I just want to be sure I understand because I do think that it could meet the criteria at a future date for initiation. Is this primarily because of the withdrawing of the application and that it would be over the owner's objection if we proceeded tonight? Yes, and the and that the threat of demolition has okay. been removed. Okay, I just I you know I just could see someday down the road where that the you know emotion might be different. So on a motion by Ronnie, seconded by John, we'll do a roll call vote. Chelsea, aye. John, aye. Ronnie, aye. And I vote aye. So. The motion passes unanimously. And Claire, I, I'm not going to forget that you will walk us through next steps. Thank you, Abby. Um, as there is no current application, this is the end of the uh, the process. The case is closed, um, although it, um, it sounds like uh, Ben is interested in opening a, a future case, um, which we look forward to seeing. So thank you. So thank you, thank you, Claire. And before we move on to our last public hearing of this evening, um, I wanted to gauge if anyone wants to take a five minute break at this point. John, I kind of, I, I will do that. So I do think this might be a good time before we start that next. Um, public hearing. So um, why don't we reconvene at 8.05 p.m.
Marcy, it looks like we're getting close to proceeding. I think um, folks are getting settled in, but I, I would say we're about ready to get started. Okay. So the next item on our agenda is item 5D, which is a public hearing and consideration of a motion to adopt a resolution to initiate the process for the designation of historic district encompass encompassing a portion of the area from 1777 Broadway to 14th Street and between Canyon Boulevard and Arapaho Avenue pursuant to section 9113.3 of the Boulder Revised Code, 1981. The owner of the property is the city of Boulder. The applicants are Historic Boulder Inc., Friends of the Bandshell, and Friends of the Duchambe Tea House. We'll move on to this hearing and thank you to um, the city of Boulder as the owners and the applicants who have, who have agreed to this virtual um, legislative hearing. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Abby. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so the public hearing procedure this evening, this initiation hearing is legislative, legislative so it's a little different than quasi-judicial. Um, it begins with a staff presentation and the board may ask questions of staff, followed by the applicant's presentation, um, after which the board may ask questions. The public hearing is then open for public comment followed by any board questions. And then after that, the public hearing is closed. The board discusses and if appropriate, adopts a resolution to accept the historic district application. And um, we don't need to do quasi uh, ex parte contact. So I will um, head right into the criteria for review, which are found for you in uh, 9-11-3 of the Boulder Revised Code and Claire just went over these, um, but there are seven factors um, that the board may consider, but is not limited to in making their decision. First is whether there's probable cause to believe the building or district may be eligible for designation. Next considers whether there are currently resources available that would allow the city manager to complete all of the community outreach and historic analysis necessary for the application. Third, that there is community and neighborhood support for the proposed designation. Fourth, that the buildings or features may need the protections provided by designation. Fifth, that the potential boundaries for the proposed district are appropriate. Sixth, in balance, the proposed designation is consistent with the goals and policies of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. And finally, that the proposed designation would generally be in the public interest. And before um, I jumped right into my presentation, but I did want to let the board know that we've invited Tina Briggs, um, Senior Landscape Architect from Parks and Rec, um, here this evening, and she's going to join in the staff presentation to provide an update to, a, to the cultural landscape assessment here in a couple minutes. I should have said that at the outset. So um, following the criteria for review, the board has two options in front of you tonight. It is um, either to uh, not initiate landmark designation, in which case this uh, case would end and a historic district could be considered in the future through a new application. There isn't the same um, time requirement of an LAC that is denied that an applicant can't apply for a full year. Um, an application could be considered in the future um, without that time uh, piece uh, for a new application. The other option is to initiate designation of the property as a historic district by adopting the resolution, uh, which is included in your packet under attachment B. Um, the Landmarks Board would designation hearing would then be held between 60 and 120 days, which would fall between September 10th and November 9th. And um, later I'll describe the other steps that would need to occur uh, prior to that hearing. So rewinding back the clock, um, this uh, historic district application, which was submitted by three community groups, um, kind of has its genesis uh, at the end of August 2021, when um, the Friends of the Bandshell sent a letter to the Landmarks Board requesting that the boundary of the Bandshell be expanded to extend um, to, the, uh, to the ditch that runs through the park. 
In November of 2021 and April of 2022, the Landmarks Board held initiation and designation hearings, recommending that City Council expand the boundary. Council held a hearing on June 14th, 2022, um, and while they chose not to expand the um, landmark boundary, they did give a nod of five for Parks and Rec and Planning and Development staff to explore a historic district um, in 2023, and uh, historic preservation staff committed to making that a work plan priority um, for this year, which brings us to January of this year, when um, staff from both of those departments began to meet and develop a collaborative approach. And uh, that includes the development of a cultural landscape assessment. And um, that is currently underway. Um, meanwhile, the three community groups submitted an application for the proposed historic district it was accepted as complete on May 30th. And that brings us to today, uh, July 12th, which is for your consideration of whether or not to initiate the historic district designation process. Um, just a recap, because there have been many emails um, between a couple of the cases this evening, um, the Landmarks Board have re has received uh, letters from 10 people since the application was um, submitted on May 30th. Uh, two of those were included and attached in the memo, and then eight of those came uh, since June 30th, and uh, those have been included as part of the the packet, and um, they were all in support of initiating uh, historic district designation. And so just to orient us in terms of what is being proposed as a historic district, you can see the um, outline on the screen, which extends from um, behind the Penfield Tate Municipal Building at 1777 uh, Broadway. It follows um, Canyon East all the way to 14th, um, including the parking lots behind the atrium, um, the tea house and Bimoka. And then it turns west and comes along the south side of the Bimoka building, crossing 13th and then turning south along um, 13th Street to Arapahoe and then extending along the border of the park to then um, Boulder Creek and returning back to uh, that Northwest corner. So um, before I dive into the history of the site and um, the criteria for your review, I want to welcome Tina Briggs, who is here. There you are, Tina. Um, she's got a couple of slides as an update for the cultural landscape assessment. I just wanna clarify that um, they are two different projects, but they are related in our staff recommendation to not initiate historic district designation at this time um, is because of the CLA that's underway. So we felt it was important um, to provide an update as part of this presentation. So with that, take it away, Tina. Um, and you're, it doesn't look like you're muted, but we can't hear you. Okay, how about now? Wonderful. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we'll just kind of start again with the cultural landscape assessment, just as that quick reminder, um, the borders that we're looking for, uh, looking at in the cultural landscape assessment really are what we call block 13, or if you think about it from Arapahoe to Canyon, um, bordered by Broadway um, and 13th, um, minus kind of a little corner that isn't owned by uh, the city of Boulder. So what we're looking at in that is really that cultural landscape assessment. So from the parks and recreation uh, perspective, what we're looking at is um, how do we put a process in place that we can examine cultural landscapes um, with a lens that we're borrowing from the National Park Service. So we're just really thinking about like the historically significant places in how we're seeing the evidence of the human interaction with the physical environment, and then looking at um, the historical integrity, the characteristics, and the periods of significance. Because we're kind of just looking at the, what I'm calling block 13, um, is really just we're looking at that park space just because we don't have a good, um, or we haven't previously used, I should say, um, this, this process. I think it's a good, precedent to set so moving forward when we're looking at landscapes um, and historic designation in general 
um, I think this is a good practice um, for us. So, um, and really just thinking, right, like how buildings are different than ecosystems, forests, prairies, and even things that could be constructed like mounds, terraces, and gardens. So uh, let's give ourselves a good framework to, to use moving forward. And then if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, it's just really kind of evaluating like, what is that, right? It's using the National Register of Historic Places. It's looking at that criteria. Um, again, we've kind of talked about the significance um, and integrity, and then what those periods look like. And then we really wanna look like at what are the character defining features and elements. And that does, it's gonna look at kind of how we're starting to look at um, Pearl Street and the Civic area and moving forward to, um, so we're using some of the models that we've used in the past, but really leaning on the National Park Service. Um, and the National Park Service it kind of has these 13 defined landscape characteristics that we're using. Um, we have a couple of sort of decision points and stopping, but ultimately if um, this goes through to the end, we would then also be creating treatment recommendations. And this is also loosely related to the historic places plan, which you'll probably have a few questions on. Um, and we're looking at the treatment recommendations that we have in there and having a very similar style of treatment recommendations um, uh, for this property, should it move forward. Um, so if you wanna go to the next slide. Right now, um, currently staff um, is working on the research, the organization and the writing of it. Um, and then, when we get closer to evaluation, we'll have a peer review of the documentation and then support on that analysis from a consultant. Um, <clears throat> and again, <clears throat> we're just focused on that Central Park area because that's really only, it's the, the um, area that Parks and Recreation owns and manages out of the historic district that we're looking at as a whole. And then really it's just looking again, it's that understanding the parks, um, what a design landscape and those character characters, characteristics are, <laughs> and then just having a, a standard process to assess undeveloped treatment recommendations. So what we're looking at is an anticipated completion of September, October, December, this September and or October um, is just loosely defined in there because we do have a few um, decision points that could stop or move us forward. So that would, that would be the variation between that end date. On the next slide, um, this kind of just is a quick thing that we're, the first thing that we're looking at is that historic significance. Um, so what are the periods that we're looking at? And again, I think the historic period, <clears throat> periods could be different um, for this area versus, you know, if you're evaluating the historic district as a whole, because we're just looking at one piece, then we'll be looking at that integrity and again, just developing the treatment guidelines. Um, and then just a quick overview of what that timeline looks like. Um, I guess if I go back one, I should be a little bit more clear on that, right? Um, sorry, thanks for going back with me. Um, what we look at is the first thing we're doing is assessing the historic significance. So right now we're looking at what those periods are. If we didn't find any significance, it would stop. Uh, my assumption is that we're gonna find significance, uh, but we haven't done the actual assessment. Then we'll move into assessing the integrity. Uh, and we're looking at the landscape characteristics. We're actually doing some GIS overlays and trying to look at different layers um, together. So we'll give you more information when we have analysis moving forward. If we don't find integrity, that's when the CLA would stop. If we do find integrity, then we would go forward and move those, develop those treatment guidelines. <clears throat> And maybe I want to say a little bit here about when we talk about this piece, how does that fit into the evaluation of the historic district and treatment guidelines for the historic district. And I would think of it very similar as uh, the Penfield Tate building has its um, treatment guidelines, Fanshawe has its own, Atrium has its own. Each one of those would culminate to work together within the historic district. So that's kind of how I see that working together. Um, so then just kind of moving again to the timeline, what you'll see there is a couple of those um, points. Right now we're in July, so we're looking at <clears throat> the historic periods, evaluating and making sure that they're correct. Um, and then we're doing some of the analysis on the mapping currently. And then by August, we'll know if there's significance or, or integrity uh, and integrity, I should say, um, and whether we're moving forward and 
let's begin the process for um, building treatment recommendations if the integrity and significance are both there. And that is a quick wrap up. So I bet there's lots of questions. So we'll just give a pause and um, I can answer anything. So I'm happy to jump in with a question. Ronnie, you go ahead first. No, no, sorry, go ahead. So thank you, Tina, for taking the time this evening to join us. So um, I think you made a compelling case of, of a cultural landscape assessment and how that aligns with how the National Park Service evaluates things. But I want to be clear, and Marcy, you're the one um, maybe best to answer this, but we currently in our historic preservation ordinance don't have a requirement for a CLA. Is that correct? That's correct. It's not required. Okay. But, 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 but Tina, I think you explained what, what the Parks and Recs um, goal is to proceed with that. My second question is, because you mentioned treatments and, you know, things like that. How does a CLA differ or overlap or correlate with, I know there's this very generous grant of $267,000 with the city of Boulder and most of the funds from the state historical fund. How does that overlap with the HIP? Are some of those treatments yes. discussed there um, and so forth? Yeah, that makes sense. So right now we have 12 uh, properties that are currently designated. So the HIP covers those 12 properties through um, the context and the significance um, and treatment recommendations. So what I would see, because the HIP is really going to be a living document, um, it's going to be very simple for us to add a chapter, essentially, to this part of, of you know, the historic district. So um, the band shell, for example, has treatment recommendations, and then the CLA will have treatment recommendations. And you know what we'll do is make sure that those are speaking the same language and not com conflicting with each other. So whether it gets <clears throat> included with the band shell later down the line after the decisions are made, or whether it's a separate part as the historic district, um, we would have to make that decision then, but it would certainly just be added as a chapter and, and should align with the other treatment recommendations. Okay, thank you. Because I, you know, it's interesting, like, are there building blocks? Do you already have some of the information and so forth? But I guess it, you have to dive into it to see where that leads. Yeah, so right now, I think we have like all the building blocks and the pieces. What we don't have is the analysis. So right now, when we're looking at, you know, we have the pieces, we know the mapping, we know what the maps that we have today and what we have in the past. Um, but we really need to start to do those overlays and then and then come out with that analysis to really have any um, basis for decision making. Thank you. And I see Chelsea and John's hands up, but Ronnie, I know you had yours up, I think, initially. Sure. Um, I was hoping that both Tina and Marcy could speak a little bit about the timing um, and how a advancement from the landmarks board tonight might have what the advantages might be for uh either department and what the disadvantages might be for either department um as opposed to um pursuing staff's recommendation which is to wait for the cla to come to conclusion marcy would you like to take that one sure and then add add anything in there so Staff's recommendation is to not initiate and um, to allow time for the CLA to be complete. And I think there are a couple advantages there. Um, one is that it will provide a gap in our understanding of the park, um, acknowledging that this area of Boulder has been studied so many times over the decades. Um, however, I don't think we have the adequate uh, description understanding significance analysis of the park itself. Um, and so that's kind of a missing piece that will um, help us write a better ordinance if it gets to that point and, and design guidelines. Um, the second piece is that there are um, additional complexities for city owned properties. And so um, there are about five or six um, departments across the city that we will be looking to coordinate with 
as well as outside entities, including CDOT, because Broadway goes through the boundary. And then the um, I think there are four ditch companies that share the Boulder um, Slough through the park. So um, that will provide us time to coordinate with uh, the various departments, entities, and then there's the community engagement piece, um, which is necessary for um, city owned properties at a higher kind of level than than a private, say, historic district. And so um, what we have envisioned is doing things like walking tours, um, some sort of online presence, open houses, perhaps a technical um, review committee to uh, draft those design guidelines that would need to happen. Um, so our uh, recommendation is based on providing additional time to do some of that legwork I think that when the code was written, I really appreciate how stringent it is with these different steps about meeting with property owners, explaining the benefits, drafting design guidelines. But I think in the most simple of cases, it is an, it is an incredibly um, aggressive schedule to get a pretty significant amount of work done. And then having this be city owned property just adds additional complexity. Uh, Tina, would you like to add anything to what I said? If there's additional questions, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to confuse it anymore, too, because you put a lot of clarity in it. Uh, Tina, I feel like, and if you don't have a direct answer to this, it's okay. Um, but I feel like it would be helpful for us to hear how the designation of this district, which I think you're hearing from staff as well as the community, um, is desired. And I will just take the big leap and say, there's almost an inevitability associated with this. Um, how the timing of the designation um, may impact the Parks and Rec Department. And you know what we're hearing from staff um, has a lot of merit about their reasoning behind um, staff's recommendation for you know, waiting for the CLA. I'm just wondering if there's any aspect for the Parks and Rec Department uh, So let me see if I understood. The, sorry, I'm echoing here just a sec. <clears throat> okay, so like the cadence of it really is thinking right now. So for example, in the historic places plan, we have um, the band shell, we've got the context, the significance, treatment recommendations, and then, you know, really what we were focusing on is there's- I think Ronnie's capital. still trying to talk. Sorry, I think oh. Ronnie's having an issue. Okay, thank you. Ronnie, are you hearing us or, or not? I don't think so. I don't either. We're, think... we're not hearing you either, Ronnie. It's like, but he's not frozen, but I, we can't. Yeah, no, he's there. Yeah. He's just silenced. I see some adjustments coming our way. I chatted to him that we're, uh, we've lost him. I'm, I'm here. Um... Good. I was complaining hear. about not hearing you guys, but I guess it was my end. I have no idea what was happening there. Sorry, Tina, you could you start again from where I ended my question, I think? <laughs> yeah, so if, if I understood the end of that question, and hopefully I caught most of it, right? Um, just thinking of like the building blocks and kind of I think how it's all working together and what it means to parks and recreation. <clears throat> so right now what we have is the HIP has helped us define our 12 properties and within those properties, we're looking at historic context, integrity, um, the treatment recommendations, and then the HIP is really helping us focus on what those capital priorities are within that, that particular property. So if you think about then expanding it to this CLA, it's really building the basis for what we would add to something like the HIP because we're building that historic context, the significance, the, and if that is all in place, then we have the treatment recommendations. So what that allows us is really as staff to be very aligned with staff and our boards and very aligned on how we should move forward. I think right now, one of the things that from the Parks and Recreation Department, right, at least even from where like I'm at is like, is there enough information to really make a decision? 
Um, and so we want to do that evaluation. And that's kind of where we're lined on that. And then looking at the historic district overall, I think what that impact means to uh, parks and recreation is um, it adds maybe a layer of oversight, um, but I don't think it's going to really prevent or change much um, of what would happen or or prevent anything, any change based on um, the treatment recommendations that we would build, I think we all are looking forward to it being that active park space and how do we keep it active um, and alive as a park space and, and work with how our community is changing. And I think um, even whether it's designated or not designated, um, I know Shahomi is probably on the phone here too. Um, we're gonna be considering because that, that particular parcel is adjacent to four or five designated um, already designated buildings, we're going to take that into consideration and we're going to be looking at those treatment recommendations regardless of whether it is a historic district or it's not. So for us, it's more just that really building towards those data informed decisions and looking for that base of information. Thank you, Tina. Um, Chelsea? John can go next. I'm still formulating my question. Oh, thank you, Chelsea. Okay, John. Okay. Um, Ronnie asked my first two questions, but I have a third. Um, and I'll throw this to Tina and Marcy. Could you talk a little bit about, in the case of a district, at least in its in its kind of simplest viewing, is a spatial boundary that's put around something that um, for whatever reason is seen to have value as a kind of singular thing. Um, can you talk about, if, if we were to say, be approached by a neighborhood group that wanted to make their neighborhood a district and a significant number or a sufficient number of the, the neighbors agree that they wanna be part of a district, um, and this, this may be a very, I guess, different set of resources. In other words, these buildings may not have all originated from the same historical building period or from the same kind of architectural tradition. And yet they feel that they have a relationship that makes them a district. Can you elaborate on the differences between designating this district that includes granted environmental and natural qualities or or pieces as well as architectural and directly historical ones um why is this so different from say designating whittier so i if from a park perspective i would say if that district included a park parcel um so then that would mean that future park would um, have a designation as part of that historic district. Um, I think the parks would want to do also do a cultural landscape assessment of that particular park within that historic district. And the question really would be, should that park be included in the district or not? And that helps us give that base of information um, for the community to use, whether they're, you know, they want to be part of the district or not, they have a, a base of information, at least for the parkland. Okay. Marcy, do you have anything? Yeah, I, I understood your question, but um, to be asking about um, eligibility in terms of a district that has um, a collection of very different buildings, is that what you were asking or or could you? Well, no, I was in, in the case, well, I, having not been through the district process in Boulder before at this level, I'm, I'm not really clear on what the whole process is mm, okay. beyond developing a guideline set and things that, you know, work with the, with the preservation of that district and to the satisfaction of the people. I, I think I, I, I want to just amplify that statement that Ronnie made about the inevitability, because I'm 
sensing a groundswell of public support for doing this. And I mean, a significant amount of public involvement in this, which is very rare for something like this. So anyway, Marcy. And um, if it's helpful, I can go through, you know, what's in the code and then expand on what is a, is in addition to it because we're adapting it to uh, city owned properties, if that would be helpful. But um, if your question's been answered, then I'm happy to move on. Okay, I, it, it was answered, I guess. I mean, no, I, 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 I think it would be helpful. Okay. I don't, yeah, I think it would yeah. be helpful. Yeah, so um, while we haven't had a new designated historic district in very long, I think 2006, um, I have been part of two proposed historic districts where the um, majority, it only takes 25% of the owners to submit a designation application. Um, so I was part of two applications that were started, but then um, weren't ultimately followed through on the owners changed their mind during the process. Um, so once a, a designation application is submitted, this hearing must occur within 45 days. And then the code says that um, staff must hold a meeting with um, the property owners to explain the benefits and responsibilities of uh, historic district designation. And then there's a questionnaire um, that is mailed out to each of the property owners to gauge their support or opposition. Um, what's interesting is that it's not a code criteria to have a majority in support in order to designate, but there is an official step to gauge um, support for the district. And then there are also draft design guidelines, which um, aren't developed for every single historic district, but if there are kind of unique circumstances, that is something that's part of the case. Um, then it comes to the Landmarks Board for a designation hearing, then to Planning Board for um, their input on the land use implications. And then the ultimate decision maker is City Council. Um, and that goes in two readings, um, first on the consent agenda typically, and second as a public hearing. Mm -hmm. um, maybe Chelsea, then Ronnie. Yeah, so because I'm just trying to understand this fully. So because all of the buildings in the area are landmarked, what are the benefits of a historic district that we don't have today? Yes, and I, I, will, um, I will point out that these questions after Tina's presentation um, oh, were meant to be focused on the CLA. I have a whole presentation yeah. to oh, give. Um, oh, okay. And then another opportunity to ask questions of staff. So, um, okay, I have one for for Tina. Great. Okay. Um, so how how would the city be, or how would parks be uh, limited in the landscape treatments um, if if a historic district was to move forward? before the um, before the study is done, the cultural landscape assessment is done. So, so sorry, your question is how would we be limited? Yeah, so let's say there was a vote tonight to move forward with the historic district. How would parks be limited um, in your work uh, in the area that was designated, um, if it's done prior to the cultural landscape assessment being completed? Um, so that's a good question. And um, so limited, I'm trying, like when I'm thinking of limited, you know, of um, in that particular area, and Marcy, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but if you guys, if the Landmarks Board decides to move um, forward with this, um, <clears throat> then that basically the Parks and Recreation Department would have to treat this area um, as if it were designated until the final decision is made. 
Um, however, right now, the only improvements that we have planned between now and the end of the year really are the band shell, and we've already applied for a landmark alteration certificate, which has been um, given to us. Um, so the really the sort of caveat for me or the thought process is, is um, the waiting for the completion of the culture landscape assessment, I think gives Parks and Recreation Board um, the information also to be really like, you know, so we're all aligned in moving down the same road. I think that's kind mm -hmm. of ultimately what we want to um, have happen here um, versus having any sort of resistance or questions or why are we doing this or how are we moving forward? So mm -hmm. laying that out really, um, <clears throat> um, really simply is really just, you know, if there's something to celebrate, what are we celebrating? And let's get really behind it and be excited about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll get into that in my commentary. And I, I appreciate that answer. Um, and if, um, if it is what, I guess, and I'm sorry that I had to miss the tour because I, my work doesn't end until five. Um, but what areas will you be studying? Like, are all are you studying all of the areas as part of the assessment, or is it the in between areas between all of the properties that are landmarked? Well, <clears throat> what we're doing in the cultural landscape assessment is the park owned property, which would be. Canyon to Arapaho, Broadway to 13th. So kind of, if you think about it, those sidewalks in are the park land. Um, that's what we're studying. So not 13th Street, not the plaza, not the parking lots. That space in between isn't owned and managed by Parks and Recreation. So we're sort of focusing on setting a precedence of how we evaluate park landscapes or a cultural landscape. Okay, thank you very much. I'll be around after Marcy's presentation too. So if any of the questions roll over, I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions I can. Thank you. Hey, Rodney, I didn't know if you had your hand up, Mark, but Tina, I have two really quick questions. Um, something you just said, um, park owned and managed. I thought the city of Boulder owned Central Park and Parks and Rec managed it. Um, and th that was just based on, on what the assessor record says. You are correct. Okay, yeah. thank you. And But I know you guys manage it and have purview over it. That, that I'm totally clear on. The second thing is, my understanding is, and it makes sense, that the treatment for the Glenn, Glenn Huntington band shell has been taken off the website as the HIP proceeds because of this pending application for a historic district. But I, th so I can't look at it right now, but I had an understanding that for the Glen, the site, the current boundary of the Glen Huntington band shell, that a CLA had been done for that as part of the HIP. Um, is that correct or am I? So we didn't do a CLA for the for those or what we called a CLA. It was a very similar process that we worked through a consultant with, but we didn't have to do the assessment because the information was already out there. Most there the sites were already registered, national, local, right? So the information and what we had asked the consultant to do was take the information available and compile it. So they weren't really digging in and looking for originals, but they were looking for what's been compiled to date and putting references to that. So <clears throat> basically that research had already been done in different ways. It was compiled. Um, so the analysis didn't have to be made, it, it was already existing. So that's just a little bit of the difference um, between the bench on that. So the reason it's just pulled down is the one thing that we wanted to do is as we're doing this, we wanted to make sure that the treatment recommendations um, in the HIP are also aligned and have the correct um, word alignment and association with this cultural landscape assessment. So it's like, let's put it on pause in the sense that if anything new comes to light that we didn't have before, so for example, the planting plan and a grading plan um, that weren't included in the HIP, we want to make sure we examine those and cross-examine them so they're very aligned and nothing has any conflict in the future, so we're not trying to figure out what takes precedence and what's 
what, you know what I mean? Like what comes first and what should we be looking at first? Those treatment recommendations need to be really aligned. And if anything new comes in light for the CLA that affects the band shell, that can be added too. So again, we're talking about the HIV as kind of that living document, um, yeah. but we certainly don't want to put conflicting information up either. Okay, thank you so much. I mean, thank you for taking these questions and, and we appreciate your willingness um, later. And, you know, um, I don't know if there's anybody else on the board that has questions before. Oh, Ronnie, yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to pick one little thing apart here, which is the proposal or the application to designate the district versus the creation and definition of the or ordinance. And I just wanted to understand that a little bit because, I mean, I feel like I could describe it, but Marcy, maybe it would be helpful to hear that coming from you. Sure. So there are um, two kind of legal components to a designation for a historic district. The first is the ordinance, which um, identifies why a uh, area is significant and can call out contributing features in that um, ordinance. And that's the designating you know, piece that, that um, creates a historic district. And then the design guidelines um, help manage change in that district over time, which are informed by the pieces that have been identified as contributing or non-contributing. What makes this area significant that then translates into how it should change over time um, and how it should be managed. Does the final designation require the completion of the design guidelines? That is a great question. Um, I was looking back at the university place uh, process from 2006 and it appeared that the um, design guidelines were adopted after the designation. Perhaps they were drafted during the process, but then adopted afterwards. Design guidelines aren't required as part of the historic um, district process, but um, they are very helpful when the properties are unique. And I would say that it would be very helpful considering the unique structures and the parkland of this proposed district that um, I think our program would benefit from and I would extend that across to other departments too, would benefit from design guidelines. Um, but to directly answer your question, I believe they can be added later. Um, and then it seems like the potential designation of the district um, is going to at a minimum set how the district meets the criteria and what the characteristics are, as well as define the boundary. Is there any question, and I feel like starting with the boundary, that's the highest level piece here of what might be in flux or you know might be impacted. Does, is there any, question or I've read a little bit about this so maybe I've already answered this about what the actual boundary should be and if we move forward with designating the district um, can the boundary change before a potential conclusion it it can and that is something that we would expect to um, assess a little farther if the board chooses to initiate the process. The decision in front of you tonight is, um, is there probable cause and do we start this process? And so like you mentioned, Ronnie, um, the process would allow time to um, look at the boundary, develop design guideline, consider the name of the district. These sort of things can be worked out during the process. Um, and the boundary can be modified all the way at the end by a city council. They're, they're the ones that set, set the boundary. Okay. I think Thank that's you. actually, that's kind of a good point, Ronnie, too, is right. Like, so because we haven't done that assessment yet <clears throat> for the CLA, if the assessment, you know, were to say that 
it, you know, it has significance, but there's no integrity that also, it, you know, and if we can kind of show that if, if that's the case, is that a cause or a thought to maybe adjust that boundary? Right. Thank Good you. Point. Marcy, do you have an, a presentation? I do, but I want to make sure that um, the questions about the PLA have been asked. Um, we have another opportunity to ask questions at the end of my presentation, but right. uh, maybe I'll take that cue to, to start it again. How does that sound? Sounds great. Okay, good. Let me get oriented here. Okay, so um, here's a map just for our reference if needed. Um, the proposed boundary includes um, five uh, individually landmarked um, buildings that are all city owned. It's the municipal building, the atrium building, the tea house, the storage and transfer building, which is also known as BMOCA, the Glen Huntington band shell, and then the Central Park. So um, I am going to um, start my presentation. I warn you, it is a bit longer than our normal 10 minute staff presentations, but because there's a lot to cover and a lot of um, uh, analysis, um, just forgive me because I'm gonna go a little longer. So um, again, the decision in front of you tonight is, is there a probable cause and then the other six um, categories. So this is not by any means an exhaustive history of the area, but I did wanna provide um, kind of a known uh, history of um, Central Park and the surrounding buildings. So starting first, this is the ancestral homes of indigenous peoples. Um, I will say there is work to be done. I don't know if that's part of this project or beyond um, to further understand that portion of the history. I will say uh, most of the documentation starts in 1859 when Boulder was founded. Um, not too much longer, after Boulder was founded, the Boulder and White Rock Ditch Company was created in 1875. And um, in this area, it was largely railroads, mills, smelters, lumber yards. These are all industries that are water-based. And so the proximity to the creek um, is why they were located here. In 1894, Boulder experienced a very devastating flood. And um, this area was known um, to flood, and so it was a more undesirable area to have houses. There were scattered residences um, in the area that's now Central Park and along the creek, um, but the more um, expensive or desired land was a bit farther up the hill. And then in 1897, the Boulder Citizens Reform Group uh, was established, and this can really be seen as um, kind of a turning point in Boulder's history. There were two kind of um, groups that were pulling for which way Boulder should grow into the future. One was very industry um, based to uh, attract the, the mills and the smelters and the lumber yards. The other ones, I think it was a quote, like a quiet and, and beautiful city. Um, and so you can see in the early 1900s, these um, citizen led efforts that um, kind of informed what Boulder is today. So um, in 1903, the Boulder City Improvement Association was founded. And in 1907, the park board was established. Um, interestingly, I don't believe it was um, appointed by the city, but it was a parks board that um, fundraised for the different areas around town um, and uh, kind of was a booster for um, creating and establishing parks. That group, um, commissioned Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. to write the improvement of Boulder and Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. visited in 1908 and produced the report that we know um, as the improvements of Boulder in 1910. To provide some context of what else was happening in this early period of Boulder, in 1898 Chautauqua was established. That was also kind of a community-led effort um, and one of the earliest parks in Boulder. The Boulder Colorado Sanitarium um, opened the same year and that was a very popular uh, treatment facility initially for um, people with tuberculosis who were coming out for the um, clear dry air. Um, and then the sanitarium kind of continued this health seekers uh, uh, theme of Boulder's history. 
Um, in the period between 1898 and 1938 saw a um, significant um, series of private land donations um, in order to establish these parks and open spaces. And um, Hannah Barker was one, um, pretty much any, any name that you might recognize from this early period, um, there were a number of, of land donations. In 1907, um, there's the Parks Board that was founded. And then in 1917, that's when um, it was officially the Parks and Planning Board of the city of Boulder. This next period looks um, to the kind of uh, period where the park was established. In 1923, Olmsted uh, produced a plan for a larger greenway, which included a World War I memorial, city hall, athletic field, and a park. And it was much larger than the park we know today. It extended um, east towards Boulder High, and as I mentioned, had these other amenities. Um, there was a legal case, the um, election was, or the vote was challenged, and then a subsequent bond measure failed. And so um, the park was reduced uh, quite a bit in size to um, its current kind of location and uh, boundaries that we know today. So in 1924, um, Frederick Law Olmsted um, Jr., his firm, which is the uh, Olmsted Brothers out of Boston, uh, produced the plan, it's a planting plan for Central Park. Um, that was in 1924. At the time, the city actually leased the land from the railroad. Um, it was an area of land that Olmsted encouraged the city to purchase, and they did so in 1933. And for context, um, it was in 1928 when Boulder passed the first zoning ordinance, and it was one of the earliest uh, in the West uh, for the United States. So the theme so far is I think a, a very intentional effort, both through legislation and then community led um, land donations and activities to make Boulder um, kind of what it is today in, in terms of um, uh, recognizing the environmental qualities of the foothills and then deciding, you know, what sort of um, zoning uh, was desired. So, um, Continuing on in this period, it was uh, in 1937, the Lions Club proposed construction of a band shell for public concerts. And Soccer de Boer was hired to recommend the site and design its setting. And then Glenn Huntington was hired to design the structure. Um, this was uh, just following the Great Depression. And um, in 1932, there were two other significant Art Deco uh, buildings that had gone up. One was the new courthouse in 1932, and then um, the high school around that time as well, uh, both designed by Huntington. In 1947, DeBoer produced a plan for the, the amphitheater seating, and that was installed in 1950. The next period um, uh, began with the bond issue for the municipal building, which passed in 1945. Um, it was envisioned to be a bit larger with um, the museum as part of it, um, but due to some funding by the time it was built, it uh, was a bit smaller. It was um, designed by James Hunter and dedicated in 1952. And then the next period looks at the um, bank building, the Midland Savings and Loan, which was designed by Hobart Wagner in 1969. And then to 1982 was the genesis of the Soviet sister city project, which saw the tea house constructed in Tajikistan in the late 80s, um, though it took a while to uh, reconstruct it here in Boulder. The location was decided in 1993, and then the tea house was reassembled and dedicated in 1998. Um, so with that, again, that was kind of a broad overview of 120 years of history. Um, if, if the Landmarks Board chooses to initiate designation, we would um, do further research and um, kind of uh, provide a comprehensive history of the site and how it's changed over time. Um, but I am now going to move into um, the criteria for review, which is found in 911.3 of the Boulder Revised Code. And um, I will be facing my screen over here. So, 
So the first uh, criterion goes to, um, is there probable cause to believe the district may be eligible for historic district designation? Um, staff considers that there is probable cause based on a number of factors. One is its inclusion of five significant buildings and their sites that have been previously designated. Uh, its historic significance in the history of Boulder's park development and for the role played by the Boulder City Improvement Association, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., the Lions Club, and Thaco de Boer, as well as its contribution to the social and cultural life of the city for over a century. Its architectural significance that includes work by notable architects, builders, urban planners, and representing examples of a progression of architectural styles, and its environmental significance for its planned and natural site characteristics that represents an established and visual feature in the community. Additionally, there have been past determinations of eligibility that have included the assessment of the following structures. The Banshell was and its site um, is eligible for a listing on the National Register, which was determined in 1995 and 2016. The atrium was found to be potentially eligible for listing on the State Register when it was surveyed in 2000. The Tea House is eligible for listing on the National Register. That was determined in 2006 and I think reconfirmed um, in the last year or two. And then the Broadway Bridge was found to be eligible for listing on the National Register in 2004. Um, Central Park was surveyed in 1995. Um, it was not, there wasn't an eligibility determination um, for local designation at that time, but it states that the park is significant for its association with the development of the Boulder Park System and with the activities and events for which the park provided a setting. Um, there was a uh, letter or a memo commissioned from uh, Mundus Bishop, the landscape architecture firm, um, I believe last year or the year before, and um, that firm determines that the significance of the band shell uh, it currently in its current boundary, that same significance did extend to the ditch, which was the proposed uh, expanded boundary. The second criterion is whether there are currently resources available that would allow the city manager to complete uh, all of the community outreach and historic analysis uh, required for this application. As I mentioned, designated of pub designation of publicly owned property requires a high level of analysis and community engagement. And if the designation process is initiated, um, we'll have about two to four months to conduct a series of stakehold stakeholder outreach efforts, including a meeting with the various city departments, um, CDOT and the ditch companies, and then also uh, along with the broader community, um, which could include walking tours, pop-up events, and an online presence through Be Heard Boulder. And then additional historic analysis will include determining the period of significance, historic district boundary and name, identification of contributing and non-contributing features, and the development of design guidelines. Additionally, um, as we've covered, uh, staff from Parks and Rec and Planning and Development Services are currently collaborating on the de development of a cultural landscape assessment to thoroughly document the site and understand it as a designed landscape. And completing the community outreach and analysis within these tight code mandated timeframes, um, in addition to the work on the CLA and ongoing program operations, will, stra will stretch our staff capacity um, and other initiatives uh, will likely be delayed or reduced in scope. The designation of publicly owned properties um, does require an increased level of analysis and community engagement by not initiating at this time. It will allow us um, additional time to uh, explore the district through the CLA and the civic area phase two planning process and allow us to streamline our resources. Third asks whether there is community and neighborhood support for the proposed designation. Uh, as we mentioned, three local historic preservation organizations have partnered on the application. And since May 30th, 10 letters of support for the historic district have been received. Um, going back to last year, during the public hearings to consider expansion of the band shell boundary, the public comment included um, eight people speaking, or sorry, 10 people total um, commenting before the November 2021 Landmarks Board meeting. 
um, 13 people speaking at the April meeting and nine people speaking at the city council meeting. And so um, staff is not yet engaged in a broader community outreach um, activities to gauge the level of support across uh, the spectrum of residents, businesses, and visitors that may be affected by historic district designation. Fourth asks um, whether the buildings or features may need the protections provided through designation. Um, as we mentioned, it includes five properties that are already designated as individual landmarks. So those structures uh, won't be impacted. Um, if anything, they'll have additional guidance through design guidelines, but the regulatory piece um, is the same, whether it's individual designation or uh, historic district designation. Um, however, um, let's see, in 2021, the extension of the CFERS tax was approved by voters, and that includes funding um, for the phase two uh, park improvements uh, in the civic area. That project is currently in its scoping phase with the site analysis starting in 2024 and schematic design uh, anticipated to begin at the end of next year with implementation starting in 2026. So historic district designation would add another layer of review for exterior changes to the landscape areas within the district boundaries, um, which would ensure changes preserve and enhance the character of the district and do not damage or destroy its contributing uh, features. So to sum summarize, there are parts with the already um, designated structures that wouldn't change. It's the spaces in between in the park that um, would have uh, a layer of design review. The next uh, question asks about the potential boundaries for the proposed district and staff finds um, upon our kind of initial review that the inclusion of the Central Park and five city-owned landmarks and the streets and plazas um, are appropriate as a concentration of significant sites that represent distinct periods of time spanning the 20th century. Um, however, staff considers the inclusion of the parking lots um, to not be appropriate, um, though of course we would study this more if the board initiated designation. Um, but best practices is not to include buffer areas. Um, and since the parking lots aren't significant in their own right, um, staff would likely recommend that the boundary be a little bit tighter to the contributing element. Um, I think we also need to look a bit more at the inclusion of uh, Broadway and uh, 13th in, in terms of their inclusion in the district. Uh, next, the code asks um, the board to consider in balance the proposed designation is consistent with the goals and policies of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. And there are a couple of policies that apply here. I won't read these, um, but uh, 2.27 uh, speaks to the preservation of historic and cultural resources, which says the city and county will identify those um, important places and um, protect them through uh, designation. 2.28 leadership and preservation for city and county owned resources states that um, the city will evaluate their publicly owned properties to determine their historic architectural, archeological or cultural significance and eligible resources will be protected through local designation. Uh, policy 2.30, um, eligible historic districts and landmarks um, notes that there are identified potential historic districts uh, within the comp plan and uh, that they will be continued to be assessed and updated. And then preservation of archaeological sites and cultural landscapes states the city will develop a plan and process to identify, uh, designate and protect archaeological and cultural landscape resources, um, such as ditches where practicable and in coordination with the ditch companies street and alleyscapes, railroad rights of way, and designed landscapes. Um, and the final criteria is uh, the proposed designation would generally be in the public interest. Um, designation protects sites and buildings that are important to Boulder's history. It enhances property values, stabilizes neighborhoods, promotes tourist trade and interests, and fosters knowledge of the city's living history. 
local district designation would not preclude alterations, additions, or even new construction, but will ensure that those changes are undertaken in a way that's compatible with the character of the district. Central Park and the surrounding civic buildings are important for the role they have played in the social and cultural life of the city and as examples of a progression of architectural styles and for Central Park's contribution to the history of park development in Boulder. However, while there is probable cause to believe the area may be eligible, staff considers that designation um, or initiating the designation process at this time would generally not be in the public interest because of the additional research and analysis uh, to determine the significance of this area that would be provided through the COA. Um, additionally, the designation of publicly owned property requires an additional level of interdepartmental coordination and community engagement. And if the designation process is initiated, um, staff will have a relatively limited time to conduct the thorough internal and external research or uh, outreach efforts that are appropriate for a district of this importance. So with that, um, staff recommends that the board not initiate the process for historic district designation in order to allow uh, the completion of the CLA to assess the parkland as a design landscape and understand its uh, characteristics um, defined by the National Park Service. It will also allow for a more robust community engagement to assess the level of support for the proposed designation, as well as interdepartmental collaboration necessary for city-owned property. Um, so with that, and I, um, go ahead, Ronnie. I just wanted to ask a question, but with that, I, were you gonna turn that back to us to ask questions? Um, I was going to do a quick check-in um, on these two slides and then be ready for your questions. Go ahead. So that concludes my staff presentation. Um, we'll now pause for any questions from the board and then move to the applicant presentation followed by public participation. The applicant has a chance to respond to um, anything that was said after the last person um, has spoken and then the board deliberates and make a, makes a motion. Um, we have estimated about 45 minutes scheduled for board deliberation. This is just an estimate, it's not, not a requirement. But the main kind of key question in front of you all tonight is should the Landmarks Board initiate historic district designation? If yes, vote to initiate designation, that starts the, the process. Um, if no, then uh, uh, vote to not initiate designation and the process for this case ends. Okay, now I'm ready for your question. Oh, actually, if you could go back to that slide, I just wanted to understand the timeline piece there, the 120 day timeline. Okay. All right, hang, hang on to this slide. Is this correct, first of all? It is, it is. Okay, and then, and then after uh, the Landmarks Board holds a hearing, then could you repeat the 45 day process? I just wanna make sure I understand the timeline. By the yes. way, for everybody listening, I'm very focused on the timeline. You're gonna hear this from me over and over again. Um, and so I wanna just beat that up a little bit. So go ahead, Marcy. Okay, this is, this is good. And I'm um, wishing I had a, a more graphic slide to show it, but, um, but I'll explain it. So um, if the board votes to initiate this evening, then the clock starts for us to do the outreach, the um, draft guidelines, all of that work prior to the designation hearing, which needs to be held within 60 to 120 days which I can go back to the beginning, it's um, between September and early November. Mm -hmm. um, that's the Landmarks Board designation hearing. Uh, and then if the board votes to recommend designation, then within 100 days, we go to planning board to get their input on the land use implications, and then to city council twice, typically once on consent uh, agenda and once as a public hearing. And that timing would be planning board around uh, November and then city council um, or planning board, November, December, um, city council, uh, January, early February. 
of next year. Okay. Okay, I'm going to ask a tough question here. You may not have an answer, but what I'm hearing is there's the CLA. There are multiple departments to coordinate with and community engagement that are kind of these three large pieces that would influence a timeline, among others, but those are kind of robust and you've described them as um, a need for, uh, you know, working on bef potentially before an initiation. If the CLA wasn't one of the factors would staff still recommend that we not initiate tonight because of the interdepartmental coordination and community engagement efforts the hypothetical is hard <laughs> to yeah. answer because we did we have been meeting and and working um, between our two departments parks and um, planning and development services um, since the beginning of the year to find this collaborative process and um, and out of that, the CLA was identified as a, a critical piece. And so um, it's hard to kind of um, guess what our recommendation would be uh, without that piece. Right. I can add, I, <clears throat> add, can I add a little something to that too? It's just when I'm thinking about this too is right. The, what the, uh, the other thing that the CLA will do, at least for the Central Park area, <clears throat> is going to, again, provide that sort of like that data-informed decision piece. So what will happen during this part is, uh, to date, um, the preservation community has been active and vocal, and we're so excited about that. Um, but because this area is so highly used by so many different user groups. When we start to talk about public engagement, keep in mind that that's going to bring, right, business owners, you know, and lots of people to the table who might have different opinions. Um, so if we insert that CLA with that information on the parkland, I think that that's a way to answer a lot of the questions that are going to come up from the community members of what does this mean and what is it going to do and what does it limit and what are we looking for and if we can really find that significance and integrity it really like helps us tell the story to the community on why this would be really important or it could help us tell the community why this part maybe isn't included in the boundary change but the boundary that's left we want to make sure that that has like the most importance and the most value so you know that boundary i think is going to be really important in that story when we start to look across the board to the community in general Helpful. I, I was hoping to just ask a couple more questions, fellow board members, just on this topic of timing. I kind of have a thought crafted here that would help if I followed through. Um, if the board chooses not to move forward with initiation tonight, would staff begin the multiple department coordination and community engagement process? We would. Um, in fact, I met with Forestry this afternoon um, and reached okay. out to CDOT. And so, um, yes, it would provide, we would make good use of that time um, in okay. terms of the uh, departmental coordination and then uh, also the, the community engagement piece. Okay. And then I just wanted to say one other thing here and correct me if I'm wrong, with an initiation, there is a, a form of protection that immediately occurs, which is the treatment of the area as though it already is a district. Mm -hmm. Correct? Okay, yes. So, Wait, Marcy, so, I thought once an application was submitted, I know for an individual landmark, it's considered landmark until a decision is made not to. Is that not true with historic districts? No, um, and Lucas, you might jump in here. Is it from the date the application is submitted or the date of the um, the initiation. And I actually have it. Um, yeah. Marcy, which deadline are we speaking of right now? Um, the piece of the code that says while an application is pending, it's subject to review um, under an LAC as if it were um, designated. And for clarification, Marcy, if we vo if we voted not to designate, wouldn't that application 
lose its protection regardless. Right. So, yeah, so, so, so the pivotal the point about an issue, that's, a, that's interesting to know, but the pivotal point about initiation would either begin a form of protection or continue the protection that's in place because of the application. Okay. Yeah. Because the one, and I, I'm sure there are multiple points, but two things that I hear from our community members and the applicant are about, one is about protection and the other is about commitment and the commitment to follow through on a plan to pursue the district. And I'd love to hear, we're gonna hear from others. I'd love to hear others' opinions on that. Maybe I'm missing pieces of this. Um, and what I understand from staff is that there's a timeline component that would be better suited to take a longer track um, in order for us to have adequate information and enough time to be able to um, carry out things, I think, in a more successful way. Um, is there any opportunity to vote to initiate and extend the hearing duration, which would, in my opinion, demonstrate that there's a protection in place and demonstrate that there's a commitment to proceed while achieving a potential objective to extend a timeline? It, I'm looking to Lucas for that one. Um, it, I think the question is, could the board, well, you've heard Ronnie's question. Well, the timelines, if this proceeds to a designation hearing under 9-11-5, those timelines can be um, extended by agreement of the, the applicant and the city and the board. <clears throat> I'm not sure how that affects the 9-11-4 public process or if that's, you know, if that's the, if that's the issue or if we're just trying to push out the, the later processes, that is the 9-11-5 and city council hearing until after you know, CLA is performed, for example. I mean, I'd love to hear staff's response, Marcy's response to that. My thought was that if the Landmarks Board hearing was pushed out, then we could follow the standard processes with city council um, and we might be able to give ourselves the upfront, more robust um, research that staff is requesting. And maybe we don't have an answer to this. I just wanted to frame that as that, and maybe again, others will speak to this, is that I hear there's a question about protection, there's a, there's a question about commitment, and then there's a desire for a different timeline, which may be an obstacle that we can work within. Um, and I'm not sure if that's the case, um, but that's what my thought process is right now. So, um, and Marcy, I'm hoping to come back to that at some point, and I'd love to hear if you have a thought about a timeline that is a better timeline. Um, I'd love to know what that actually means, and I know that's asking a lot of you right now, um, but maybe you or Claire or somebody can be thinking on that, and I'll, um, you know, hand over the microphone to my colleagues. I see questions from Kelsey and Abby. I don't know who wants to go first. Go for it, Chelsea. Okay. Um, okay, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around this question, so forgive me if I stumble through it. But in reading the memo, it says, so it says uh, in the part around the cultural landscape assessment, it says if the first and second steps of this assessment conclude the area does not possess significance or integrity, then work on the CLA will stop and the city will not apply for historic district designation. That makes sense to me if they're, if the parts of what we're, trying to make a historic district don't actually qualify under these guidelines, then it doesn't become a historic district. My question is, 
how if we were to move forward with or how are we able to move forward with creating a historic district without i guess we're just because if if we go forward with the initiation we're just saying that we think that there's a chance that there's a historic district so i think i just answered my own question i apologize um is that is that correct is that yeah, I mean, your threshold tonight is, is there probable cause to believe this area may be eligible for designation as a historic district? Okay. And I'm, I know that Ronnie just talked a lot about different timelines, but I'm not sure if the question was answered and maybe if it, if it wasn't, I'm sorry, that how long the CLA will take and when it will start. Yeah, I can take that one. So the CLA is underway. Um, okay. Yeah, underway. so right now, um, research and background has been um, pulled together. We're looking at, right now we're defining what uh, the historic periods of significance could or should be. And then our next step is to look at the integrity. So mm -hmm. right now we're looking at, you know, when you see those stops, we're looking for, does it have significance? So the answer to that is we have found enough significance that we're now gonna go to that next step and start to look at the integrity. So right now we're doing analysis on the integrity mm -hmm. of what we have. And then, you know, what it's gonna look like is, um, you know, some mapping, for example, is gonna show, um, you know, for this particular period, this is the period of significance that, you know, uh, we're going to mm -hmm. focus on because it has the most value and then we're looking at the integrity and then what is left of the integrity in there so then when we look at it is what is the historic district at that point actually protecting and saving mm -hmm. in that integrity right and so help? um so okay yes thank you for the timeline so the timeline is we will have these answers in September or what's it's in the, the date? Okay. Yeah, it's the mm -hmm. September October time frame, and the reason we have two of those is our next step is to look for that integrity. If mm -hmm. that integrity is found, then we will immediately start to go into looking at what those treatment recommendations would look like, and then that would take until early October. Okay. If we and don't then find integrity, then the CL CLA would stop in September. Chelsea, if I could just say something, if it goes to the end of October from today, that's about 105 days. I feel like saying that because we're going to talk about days again, and I'm hoping that staff talks a little bit about days later, but that's a, a 105 days from today period would be end of October if I did my math right. So then keep in mind, right, like our memos and things have to be turned in about three weeks in advance of like of the next meeting. <laughs> so, you know, once we have that finalized document, um, we're going to have a peer review with the consultant, which is included in that timeline. And then basically when we have a final document, we're assembling that for um, our boards, which our memos go ahead in, you know, three weeks in advance with the review and all of that sort of thing. So it, it when you say 110 days, yes, I just want to think about adding those two just staff side of things. Yeah. And where do you imagine the, um, the community engagement and public, like the broader part, public participation um, component of this fitting in in a way that would be the most um, meaningful for the public? So Marcy is, runs the public engagement, so I'll let her take that part of it. Sure. Yeah, well, I think it's the, um, it depends on the timing. So going to the public, once we have the historic analysis and the, the history written would be helpful, but before the design guidelines were drafted. Um, so it, I know it's, um, it's not a specific timeline and we intentionally didn't um, kind of sketch out every possible outcome um, based on on this evening but um, mm -hmm. but the, generally there is a sequence that makes sense of 
having enough information to then present to get good feedback and get broad feedback, um, but not have it so cooked that, you know, the design guidelines are already finished or the um, mm -hmm. is already written. Okay. And then, no, that makes perfect sense. And yeah, I just kind of get a general sense of when that fits in. And then, so let's say we don't move forward with doing a historic district tonight, but we, um, but we go through this whole process. So we have the, uh, the CLA, some community engagement that will help to, um, inform decisions around the guidelines and then at what like at what point would the uh historic district be is there like a resubmission or like at what point do we actually step back into this process with the landmarks board yeah i mean i think there's work that can be done before, like if the board chose not to initiate tonight, there is, you know, this work that we can get started on that is focused on um, the coordination, the assessment, that sort of piece. Um, I would say that uh, that if the CLA determines there is um, integrity and uh, going forward, then um, bringing forward an application once the CLA is done. And I apologize, I'm not gonna have specific um, timelines in mind. It takes so yeah. much coordination between staff and different departments um, for me to tell you, you know, or to make a commitment of when we would come back. It, that being said, um, designation applications can come from three entities, the city, the property owner, or a recognized historic preservation organization. So um, I'm speaking more of like, city uh application so yeah and that makes sense and again yeah i don't expect to i'm just trying to figure out where in the like steps would that happen so that would happen if it was the city um bringing it forward it would happen after the cla was right. done and would the community engagement happen would there be community engagement before the historic district is brought back because i guess my question is one of the things like this was we talked about this a year and a half ago and one of the questions or concerns we had was that there wasn't enough community engagement up until that point and so i just want to make sure or like, I want to understand the, is there an intent to have more community engagement before the, it's an application is brought forward or is it once the application is brought forward, then the community engagement starts at that point? I, so I agree that there needs to be robust community engagement, not only to inform things like the design guidelines, but also to understand what is the broad community support or opposition to a historic district. And so um, whether it happens before, you know, the um, a new application were submitted, uh, whether it happened before that or during it, um, we have a draft engagement plan ready. Um, we're working with the folks in communications um, and our intent is to have a robust engagement piece. Um, but I, again, I don't have the each step of the process kind of figured out at this point. Um, I, I will say that I think there is a sequencing thing with the CLA in terms of um, when we would go out to the community. Um, it seems like a preference would be to do that after the CLA were, were completed. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think, I think those are my questions, thank you. And Abby? So, and first of all, thank you everybody. Um, I think we, we did expect a robust conversation and that's already happened. I think that um, 
it's very important we hear not only from our esteemed applicants, but also our dedicated members of the public on this. But Marcy, I did have one comment. I really appreciate both in your presentation and memorandums when you spell out the number of people who have speak and supported, but I want everyone on this board to be very mindful that when historic Boulder speaks, it's not one person. They are speaking on behalf of dozens of people of the organization. And, you know, I want to be careful now for whatever questions I do have not to really tip into what I think I should wait and say at um, during our deliberation. But I just want to be mindful, you guys, if someone is representing historic Boulder, that's not really just one voice. It's many voices of the premier advocacy group in Boulder for historic preservation. And speaking of historic Boulder, Marcy, tell me when you think we're ready to have them begin their presentation. I see another question from Ronnie. Oh, Ronnie, sorry, thank you. Yeah, thank you. No, it's actually not a question, it's just a statement. Um, I, as we're about to go into the other aspects of this um, meeting tonight, I just wanted to say, I read staff's presentation as support of, of initiating designation and a request to delay it um, because of a process-oriented uh, timing component. So I just wanted to say, I don't think this is a debate as to whether or not the area rises to the merit of initiating designation because of the characteristics, the people, the environment, like staff wrote up a really great report about that. Um, and you can hear my interest primarily, and not that this is everyone's, is about staff's request associated with timing. Um, I just thought that I would say that um, in a hope that as we continue to move forward with other uh, comments and presentations, um, that if everybody is in agreement with what I said, um, that staff is actually saying that the project rises to the merit of designation for all of the other criteria-based pieces that have to do um, with the with the, the place and the people. And, and Bobby, I, oh, sorry. I just I just want to clarify that I I agree with that statement, and I also do want to acknowledge that I do believe the CLA is going to provide a missing piece of information that will help us uh, will help us understand particularly the park space as a designed landscape. But um, yeah. in general, yes, it's it's more about the timing and the resources of this application. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. I didn't mean to diminish the role that staff is presenting the that the CLA would play. Um, thank you. And and Ronnie, I totally agree that I think Marcy, you you very well made a case of the significance and important importance of this, not only in the staff memorandum in your presentation, but the site visit you arranged on Monday, you know, it, it brought it home to me and reconfirmed to me how how special that area is. Thanks, Debbie. I I'm all set. Okay, I don't see any other board questions. So I think we'll go now then. I'll hand it back over to you, Abby. Thank you, Marcy. So my understanding is that Bob Meckel, board president of Historic Bowl, Boulder, and Leonard Siegel will be giving the 10-minute applicant presentation. Yes, and I think they're both on the call. Welcome. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I've enjoyed this conversation. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks you, thank you for all your work. Um, I'm I am Bob Muckle. I'm former mayor of Louisville, and uh, got my start at historic preservation there, and now the president of Historic Boulder. I do want to just uh, shout out to uh, Marcy for picking an excellent background, because uh, you could you could almost see the house I grew up in uh, behind you there, uh, Cross Feely Lake. Um, so uh, can we go forward a slide or two here? And one more. 
So, uh, so you know, frankly, my introductory remarks mostly have been covered by the staff presentation. I just want, wanted to remind us we all got here because there was an application to expand the um, the landmarking of the Bandshell uh, 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 land uh, landscaping, and uh, when we that got to the city council, the staff recommendation by James was that we actually go down this road to creating a district and the council appeared to agree with that as marcy said so so that's how we're that's how we've gotten here um can you uh go forward to slide uh so i i, I this slide is just to reiterate what abby just said which is that uh the, you know we're not it's not just those of us on the call tonight i mean there are you know are hundreds of historic boulder members who are reading about this in our newsletters and websites and also the friends of the t-shell and friends of the band shell so we're you know we're small but mighty um can we uh go for it again one more slide so um so this is actually kind of our primary issue is what is the issue that ronnie was talking about which is we're interested in having preservation of we, what we consider the kind of critical historic uh, and public heart of the community. Uh, and there are going to be other planning processes uh, in progress while the CLA is in progress. So, you know, we support the CLA. Uh, you know, good data is always good data. Um, but there's also civic park planning um, uh, process is going on. This this picture shows a previous uh, civic park plan where the band shell was gone, even though the band shell was landmarked at the time this uh, plan was completed. So we're, we're concerned about having protection for the park. Uh, I mean, as it's been it's been said that all the, the buildings are protected, but the landscaping between them and of the park itself, uh, we feel like needs protection uh and the idea of delaying how long the process takes i think would be pretty we might be pretty amenable to that if there's a way to get protection uh for the park and this district during that time frame so I'm, i'll have a few other things to say at the end but i want to let uh len's going to kind of go through our kind of the beat of our application so th but thanks again everyone for um letting us present tonight all right Thanks, Bob. Um, the next one. So uh, just Marcy did a great job in identifying the components of the uh, the district, but I just wanted to reiterate that um, what's unique about this district beyond any other landmark district in Boulder is that it's a timeline representing most of the historic areas of Boulder, starting with the ancient indigenous peoples who um, inhabited Colorado and then the, the banks of Boulder Creek. Next image. And of course, uh, you can see that strip in the middle ground of the trees along the creek. So this town founded itself along the banks of the creek. It was really uh, the crux of why we were in this location and right there on that spot. Next image. And then the railroads came to town. And this image is interesting because this wasn't an 1870s image. This was more like a 19, uh, 1950s image or just, I think, before the seating was built for the Banshell. But you can see the trains are still there. Canyon was a train uh, yard. The Banshell was never an acoustical performance space because there was always traffic there. Um, so, but it has that history and the city storage, thanks, next image, the city storage and transfer building, um, also part of that whole uh, train history, next image, and then um, the influence of Olmsted, and you've seen this image before, but the next thing, the next image I wanted to show is he was, that, that company was really trying to clean up the slum that existed along the park, along the creek, to turn it into a park. Next image. And then building on that was Sako de Boer's um, contribution. This is a sketch he did um, that showed um, a grander uh, tower element for the municipal building, the Central Park band shell. Um, and so he already was thinking about ideas that are still in place um, in the park today in the region. Next image. And then 
the depression era very strongly represented by um, the bravado of an, a geometric art deco shell uh, and the seating next image uh, the post-world war ii boom time in boulder uh, when it expanded not only with population but with the federal labs coming to town um, the prosperity in town and the the optimism that's represented in the municipal building the next image and then in the 60s, there was a huge growth in the population and uh, companies like Midland Savings were providing a low uh, cost loans for working class people to be able to build in Boulder. And then it had a second life as the city grew as a place for um, uh, the government to grow into. Next image. Thank you. And then the tea house really was kind of blew the, the minds of a lot of people because it was Boulder saying, we're like a united nations we're going to try to create peace in the world and have an expanded sister cities program so um the next image um really goes to why this district is in the public interest um it's going to help to reinvigorate um the park give it a fresh appeal sort of rebrand it with a new cohesive story the next image please it's going to be able to open up the neighborhood to attention on a national level that could be uh, receive support from national organizations like the ones listed here. The next image is really the same kind of story, except at the state level, maybe even stronger attention that it would receive. And uh, it could be a feature at the upcoming uh, Colorado Preservation Inc. Saving Places Conference in Boulder. Next image. And then um, tourism. Um, could be increased, the publicity of landmarking could attract more events to better utilize the neighborhood and the pride of the city um, would be exemplified in celebrating this intact timeline of historic areas of Boulder. Uh, next image is the boundary, kind of a blurry image, sorry, but our intention was to just draw a line around all the elements to call it a, a cohesive, clear land area. And except for the southern portion of Central Park, all the properties in the district are landmarked. We are open to adjusting the boundary through the processes with the preservation planners. But with all due respect, the applicants strongly advise that the CLA is not necessary to determine that Central Park is culturally significant. The data informed decisions that Tina mentioned as a justification for the CLA is valid in principle, but the data already exists. There's a, abundant documentation that the park was designed by two of the most famous planners in the history of America. And much of that uh, design is still intact. And furthermore, Central Park has tremendous social history that wouldn't show up in a CLA. It has been the setting of hundreds of cultural community events for a hundred years. The decision of this landmarks board can and should be independent of the CLA. This is a preservation issue and the proposed district is about preservation. And finally, we just wanna say the applicants have been out working to get notice to the public and business owners, including the farmer's market, in many ways since last summer. And there's a lot of acknowledgement of the historical importance of this neighborhood. So now I wanna turn over the rest of our time to Bob. And I'm not sure how much time we have left, but go for it, Bob. Do we have time left? We have nine minutes left. Is that possible? No. 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 One minute. Um, well, so I'll just reiterate one of the things Len said there, which is that we we are we have been working to get the word out to the public, and we would be very happy uh, the our preservation groups to assist the city in this in any way we can. Which would you know we would have booths at the farmers market, offer tours of the historic districts. So, I mean, we we're willing to. You know, put boots on the ground to help with uh, the areas where where we can, um, and uh, and then I I just I want uh, I don't need to take a lot more time. I want we we believe that we've shown probable cause that the uh, central that this district uh, is is landmarkable. We believe that we uh, showed that it's uh, has integrity in our application. I mean, we have maps of the. Mm -hmm. uh, trees that were planted and uh, with comparison uh, of trees that are still there um, that we provided to um, uh, the park staff anyhow. So the, um, so again, we don't oppose this, the CLA at all, um, but we don't think that the 
landmarking process should stop waiting for that. I mean, Marcy said we don't you don't, we don't have to have the design guidelines. I don't think we probably have to have the treatments from the CLA done either in time to do the landmarking decision. We need we need the initial you know, we need the, in, the information to compel us that it's got integrity and it's got uh, and it's got historic significance. And like I say, we we believe that that's already demonstrated, and we I don't we're not worried that the CLA is going to somehow find that this area that's so obviously uh, significant is not significant and doesn't have integrity. So we we really feel like the process could go forward. Uh, and we actually we urge you to go forward with uh, design with the initiation uh, tonight. Uh, I'll emphasize what I said earlier, which is we're we're not opposed to an idea of of extending the process if there's a way to do that. I mean, I don't remember enough of the details of this, but the atrium building, what we were asked to put that on hold by the staff for like several years <laughs> where it was protected all that time because it was in this process of being designated. And if there's some way to do a similar, I mean, we wouldn't want to do this for several years, but if there's some way to do that for several months and give the more time for the staff to finish all this work, um, you know, we would support that. So. And I think that's all I need to say. Thanks again. Well, thank you with 23 seconds to spare Bob and Leonard and you will get an opportunity, um, a three minute chance to respond to anything that is said during public comment. So um, I, I'm ready to move to public comment. I don't know if any of my colleagues on the board have specific questions for Leonard or Bob at this point. I, I do. Ronnie, I see your hand, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> well, um, Bob, it's nice to meet you. And um, excellent presentation, both of you. Leonard, it is always wonderful to hear you speak. And I've heard you touch on um, similar topics when we um, walked the campus area just the other day. But I just have to tell you, um, your reporting of it is outstanding um, and it's definitely engaging. And I hope that there is a documentation of the storyline um, that is you know, easily accessible to the public um, that tracks something similar to what you're um, saying, because it's very compelling. It's compelling for me. And I'm sure there will be other versions and more robust information. I'm sure you could even share a lot more information with us. Um, but I really do appreciate the work that um, your organization and you guys as individuals are putting into this. Um, I just, you, you heard, um, I, I feel like I heard you say the protection piece is important and you gave documentation of a 2015 plan that like, you showed the ban shell gone. So the protection piece associated with initiation clearly is a priority. Um, and hopefully designation, right? Um, and then the commitment piece, um, just to touch on again, I, I do think that we're gonna hear some of that from the public, but I do hear a little bit from that, from you guys as well. And, and also how it relates to maybe a prolonged timeline associated with the atrium. Um, I think I heard Bob say um, that there could be uh, a negotiated timeline and an understanding of why there is merit and of, of having a slightly longer timeline. I, I do rely on staff's reporting of their ability to, you know, conduct the work that they need to, as well as staff's reporting of um, what a smooth process that's an interdepartmental process might look like. Um, but I just wanted to now ask you, Len, um, what your thoughts are about uh, um, extended timeline with m with maybe boundaries that are agreed on that isn't some infinite you know multi year timeline but something that we craft collectively based on uh, reasonable expectation um, from the applicants and a reasonable timeline from um, staff. Thanks, Ronnie. I appreciate that, and I uh, I think. Bob and I are having a Vulcan mind meld and we're on the same page that we would be in favor of extending the timeline so that the staff can do their work in a thoughtful manner as long as uh, the voice of 
uh, history has a, a seat at the table during the civic area phase two project, because that's even more concerned in some ways than the CLA, because that I'm not sure if you know about it, but there's an RFP that's about to come out by the city to have a redesign of the entire civic area from 9th Street to 14th Street. That includes this dis proposed district. And if there's no protection for that, then the voice of historic preservation is 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 gone, is not at the table during this design process. So that's why it's important to initiate tonight. So great, thank you. I really appreciate that additional information. Uh, I don't have any more questions, Abby. Chelsea, did you have any? Uh, yes. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, well, you sort of just answered my question, which was you had talked about there being a perceived or a threat in the area. And I, I was curious what that threat you were perceiving was. And it sounds like it's the civic area plan. Is that correct? Yes. And yes. I'm curious what your thoughts are. I mean, that was a plan that was voted on by the um, Boulder community to reimagine the civic area, right? It was a tax that was voted on and approved by the community. So there's clearly interest in, um, in reimagining the civic area. And so I'm curious what your thoughts are on the tension, I suppose it's a tension, between, you know, you had thousands, tens of thousands of people voting to support a reimagining of the civic area and the preservation of the civic area. And I think that, you know, it's it's a it's something that I'm grappling with personally. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Well, there is there is a historic preservation ordinance that the community has been supporting for 50 years. So it's not like um, you know, there's not a voice uh, out there of interest in the community for historic preservation as well. And that historic preservation allows for thoughtful additions and changes to historic properties. So we're totally supportive of a re-examination of the Civic Park to create more benefits for the great needs that the community has, such as workforce housing, et cetera, um, for bike lanes, for multimodal transportation, uh, for helping the homeless. We're supportive of that. But if, but historic preservation is a voice that this community values as well, and it should be at the table. Uh, so I, uh, I agree with that. I mean, I mean, the, the, the design plans for the whole, you know, whatever that is, five blocks of the Civic Center, so we're not talking about all of that property, but we're, you know, we, we, well, just to reiterate what Len said, which is that, you know, this, the, having a, the historic preservation voice at the table doesn't mean that you won't be able to do things that the community wants to do with the park, but you'll have to, you know, you have to contend with at least the input from the historic preservation co community. I also would just want to take a quick moment to respond to Rowdy. I have a talk that I give about the importance of city staff and how much value they add to communities. So I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Chelsea, did you have any additional questions? I don't think so. John, at this point, do you have any? I'm not seeing or hearing from John that there, there is. So let's move on to public comment for this public hearing. Um, please raise your hand or press star nine if you're phoning into this meeting, if you would like to speak to this item. Thanks, Thank Abby. you, Abby. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> How do we do that? That's amazing. Um, I, I see a couple of people. Catherine Bath is going to be our first speaker. And actually, Marcy, she has a slide that she'd like to share. If you could bring that up. It's after uh, Leonard and Bob's presentation. 
So Catherine, you may be, go ahead and begin your three minutes. Um, can you, you can hear me. Oh, okay, here we go. Okay. Um, can we move this uh, up a bit so you can see? All right, look at the lower. Uh, I'm Catherine Barth. And um, we started, we formed Friends of the Bandshell after the 2015 drawing came out showing the bandshell gone, the seating gone, many trees gone, the <laughs> grading gone. And that's when our organization was formed. We also formed uh, Friends of the Tea House and that was mostly just to help them with uh, thinking about paint and how they should be handling the building and also help them when they, when they decided they wanted to landmark it. But in this particular photograph that you can see in the lower um, left-hand corner, this is a 1940 uh, aerial photograph. And really sometime just get a magnifying glass because you can see almost everything in Boulder, the Boulderado and the, new, and the county buildings. And you can even see up on Mapleton Hill. I don't know how this photograph is so excellent, but it is. And you can look in, in, in uh, 1940 in the lower left-hand corner, and you can see that that photograph goes beyond where the uh, ditches and it encompasses almost all of the area that we are talking about. I don't. I wish it went a little further so we could actually see Arapahoe Avenue. But there is the park, and that is what it looked like in 1940. And if you were able to just, if you just were in there today, it is not much different. Olmsted, one of his tenants was that people should be in secure and shaded and safe areas. And he would, he recommended that people sit under trees and that they have views to the mountains. And the mountains, of course, are just a bit, you know, to the left. And it, it, you can see that is both in the upper part of the park, which is above the irrigation ditch, which you can also see, you can actually see the water. And then you can see that other round area toward the lower left corner. And that's the second part, it's, it's not part, this is the part that we would be adding to the site. And again, Olmsted's discussion about being sheltered and gazing onto the mountains and, and the health, both mental and physical health that would come to the population from having parks. He recommended that parks be no more than, a, than 15 minutes away from any part of Boulder. And he did uh, design a number of parks that were not built, but this one happily was. And, um, I believe that if today both uh, Olmsted and De Boer just were dropped into this park, Olmsted could say, hey, De Boer, that van shell turned out pretty well, and they would both recognize where they were from when they were working here. So, so, so I think that gives a lot of the integrity of the town. So, so am I getting close I'm to sorry. my end of time? Yeah, we let you go a little over. We're very okay, sorry. Okay, thank you so much. Catherine, and, thank uh, you. I, I, thanks, Lynn. And, uh... Okay, next up we have uh, Dan Corson, followed by Fran Mandel Sheets. Thank you. Welcome, Dan. I'm muted. Okay. No, we can hear you now. You can? Okay. Hi, I'm Dan Corson. Um, I've chaired the Landmarks Board, the Planning Board, two terms on City Council, and I'm a member of the Friends of the Bandshell. I want to talk about process a bit because I do not believe that citizens should be punished by, a, I will term it, a less than ideal process that has occurred. I am actually frustrated, embarrassed, and saddened by how this has occurred. Uh, you know by now that just last year, Friends of the Bancho wanted to extend the boundaries to what they were originally envisioned. That was not, they decided to back off because train cars were there. 
uh, Landmarks Board agreed, uh, but staff said, no, we disagree. You should do it as a district. Uh, and by breaking tradition, staff went against, in its recommendation to council, the Landmarks Board determination. If that had not occurred, we would not be having this meeting this evening and the many, many evenings of, of, of meetings on this matter. Um, the uh, five, it was a five, four vote with a request by some council members that this be heard by this council by the end of the year. That's not going to occur. I believe that there are still some council members who believe it is going to occur unless they've been uh, advised. Uh, Marcy talked about a collaborative process. The collaborative process did not include the citizens. Uh, if it had, this is, a, this is one of the reasons the initiation was filed, to get information on what was happening. And then we find halfway into, over halfway into 2023, that we just can't do a district without a lot more stuff, a lot more information. Shouldn't that information been imparted to the city council 13 months ago before it made its final decision on the, the small increase of the boundary? And also regarding the CLA, the experts on this site are right here in Boulder. Catherine Barth, preservation architect who's spoken before me and former planning director, Peter Pollack, who, and I'm not exaggerating, have, have put in hundreds of hours of research on this site, not only in Boulder, but in Brookline and the Library of Congress. You know, have they been consulted on this at all? We also have a hot off the press tree, sir. Um, you are a citizen board and you are one of the most important things that is occurring. When I was on the council, I thought appointment of the boards was the most important role of a city council. And uh, you're the most important people in this virtual room. Your obligation and the maintenance of your integrity requires the best reasonable advice you can give. And I'm very impressed with the questions that have been asked by uh, the board members so far in terms of that. You may get shot down again in terms of your record, but you will retain your integrity. Shouldn't we have the city government of the citizens, by the citizens, for the citizens, rather than one of, by, and for the convenience of the staff? Thank you very much, and thank you very much for your service to our community. Thank you, Dan. And next, uh, Fran Mandel Sheets. Can you hear me, Abby? Yes, we can hear you, Fran. Great. Thanks for waiting. I'm in the East, so this is really late for me right now. Um, and I won't repeat what's been said. This has been an amazing um, and very wonderful um, discussion that you guys have held tonight. And I think Marcy's um packet and um Len's talk and and Catherine's talk really do display how much we really do know about this area and how qualified it is to be um a a, a, a district um and I just don't know why um Parks is putting this CLA in there now except to to not have us at the table while um, this process is going on um, and i just want to remind people that that um, in chautauqua they did a cla and two years later the nhl um, designation came through and it pretty much invalidated what the work was on the CLA um, and it's never been the CLA has never been updated in Chautauqua, which makes it largely irrelevant in many in many ways. Um, and that will happen again if they do it backwards. I have yet to have a, a, an answer as to why they cannot be done at the same time, why we can't be parks do their CLA and get their answers. Um, and why preservation can't go ahead and have a seat at the table and um, push for designation. Um, there, there, just, there, there just has not been an answer to this. Um, and, and I still, just to reiterate what a number of people have said, the, our problem is that it doesn't seem that preservation is really valued or understood. Um, and in that process, 
if we don't get a place at the table, if there is no initiation going on, we won't have any protection. And that's the bottom line in all this. Um, and um, I just wanted to remind people again that on June 14, we were promised that this would happen within this calendar year, 2023, um, that they would complete this historic district. Um, and if this can't happen because we don't have staff, why does some of the money from the CLA go to support more staff time that would be helpful in, in having making this occur? So that's my um, overall, I just support all of you people and I hope you all do. I hope this board does vote to initiate. You guys came through for um, the um, expansion on the band shell last year and we have to come back and this is our this is the solution that the city gave us and so thank you for supporting that and thank you for supporting this this time too thanks thank you fran um other members of the public who wish to speak to this topic yes next up we have patrick o'rourke followed by lynn siegel thank you claire patrick Hi, everybody. Uh, Claire, could you go ahead and put up the timeline for the CLA while we're talking? Uh, this process started a year and a half ago. Actually, it almost started by the time this is done over two years. Staff, you've had plenty of time to get your ducks in order. Um, you knew when the band shell expansion was moving forward, it was your recommendation to do a historic district. It wasn't from the historic boulder. And so if I'm sounding a little angry, um, I think I am uh, because you let us down. So um, Len's comments are right on. The integrity and the significance of this area has already been documented time and time again. What are you waiting for? The city of Boulder has two landscape architects on staff. One of them spoke tonight and you know what? And I'm looking at the timeline. It's already been determined by her own words that this property is significant. The question is, is it, does it have integrity? Of course it has integrity and she knows it and Marcy knows it and so does everybody on this call tonight. So I'm just really disappointed that this occurred. And it reminds me the last time there was a CLA, it, it, it mentioned uh, it was done on Chautauqua, as Fran just mentioned. And at that time, the Parks and Recreation Board recommended the demolishment, uh, the demoing certain buildings there. And was, wouldn't have that been a tragedy if Historic Boulder and other organizations weren't in the room? And going back to process, in January of this year, and Marcy, you misspoke, uh, the phase one initial project for this area is already started. Uh, the scoping and project management, it's to be completed by the end of the summer, this summer, not next summer. The pre-planning work started already in the second quarter, and it's to be completed by the fourth quarter of this year. So it's done. The designs are scheduled for the fourth quarter of this year through the third quarter of next year. So when they're talking about timelines, this is the most current one. And last but not least, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the 2015 comprehensive plan. It hasn't been executed. And so we're talking about several acres and we're down to literally talking about one and a quarter acres on this whole project, holding up this deliberation. Because let's I wanna remind everybody, the architect, Monday's Bishop, I believe, already signed in on the historic integrity of the band shell plus the land up to the creek. So we're left out of the four acres of the CLA, we're left with one acre. And we all know, and everybody on this call knows, it meets the guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Lynn Siegel.
I'm mystified why this has not done decades ago. Um, you know, one of the reasons might have been it should have gone down to the Millennium Hotel and we should have the Millennium now. Instead, there's so much debate over it. Five hours last night, five hours a month ago, another five hours on the Millennium because it's not turning out the way they planned. You know, if, if, if that historic preservation had been done in the Millennium, it would be avoid all of this. Um, avoid all of CU takings of the city of Boulder again. Um, CU is a great thing. Dan Corson spoke tonight. His family helped get it here instead of Canon, Canyon City. But it should have been all the way up to, uh, to even find park and the whole area. And if the CLA is going to benefit the city somehow was some kind of national historic preservation. We've got that behind us anyway. We don't need to over engineer this thing. Why study what's clear and obvious? Boulder has another history and that is doing a lot of studying of what they know better. And this thing should have been done a long time ago. And it's clear, you know, this is historic place. One of the historic aspects of it is the homeless living around there. And back then they were trying to get that cleaned up. Now it needs cleaned up more than ever, doesn't it? You know, so do we need this historic district? Yes, but long time ago. and. Holding things up, waiting for staff. Um, what for? What all of this, all of this complication. It's not complicated. It's very simple. This is an educated town, you know, university here. Get things done. Just do it. Um, I give up the rest of my time for you to think about how it is that Boulder's taken so long to do something so simple and that's so obvious. Done. Thank you, Lynn. Um, are there, <laughs> excuse me, any additional members of the public, Claire? Yes, Abby, our uh, last hand raised is Kristen Lewis. Thank you. Hi, welcome, Chris. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Kristen Lewis, and uh, I do support the proposed district application. And I think this is a great opportunity for Boulder to lead by example. And, and you know, this process has gone on a long time. I think we're very fortunate to have five historically important structures in near proximity. And I see the district as a way to really protect them. Um, I'm concerned about the protection issue. Um, I think, um, especially since, you know, the original plan was that we would probably house some city offices on the uh, east side and that, you know, there was some bookend thing. And once the, uh, the city, once it was decided that the city is going to consolidate at the Boulder Community Hospital site on Broadway, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. And I and I don't think landmarking it, uh, the district, is going to preclude future development. I think it can, you know, but it does, to me, it's very important that there be protection and that the landmark board be at the table and be able to look at a broader issue. I mean, you guys have um, a lot of institutional knowledge that um, all these disparate groups don't necessarily have. So um, a lot has been said, and I and I just see that um, that this is a really good opportunity and that you guys should 
um, approve the landmark designation tonight um, uh, and, and be involved. And I think that, uh, you know, I appreciate all the pressures um, that staff has right now and um, will really continue to have. And I, you know, it's my feeling that if the district is approved, um, uh, if the proposed district is approved, uh, the other priorities can also be attended to, uh, especially if we can, you know, work on some extended dates. But I think it shows a real commitment to, um, you know, to to preserve this site. Um, and uh, you will have Friends of the Bandshell, the Tea House, and Historic Boulder at your side. <laughs> so I encourage you to um, support the district. And that's all. Because everybody is, and I, and Marcy, I really appreciate your background information. That was really helpful. Anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us. Um, Claire, any additional hands, or do you want to give a last call for this? I don't see any additional hands, but a reminder that this is your last opportunity to use the <laughs> raise hand button if you would like to comment or press star nine if you are joining by phone. And I am not seeing anyone additional who would like to comment, Abby. Thank you, Claire. So we now will officially close public comment for this hearing. I do want to give Leonard and or Bob an opportunity. You have an additional three minutes to comment on anything said during public comment. I don't think I have anything to add. I might, I might uh, just touch on what Patrick said, which is just that it's been this process has been going on a long time, which and you guys have been involved in that, so you know that. Um, but um, otherwise, I think what I had to say earlier about our, you know, wanting to have protection and being willing to work on timelines is probably the that's that's my take home message. I think. Len. Leonard, did you have anything to add? Oh. I think Len might have frozen. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I forget, somebody commented on this, I'll just say it while we're giving it let a chance to recover, which is that this has been a very, uh, this has been a, a deliberation and a discussion amongst the board and the staff that's very um, encouraging about uh, good government. So thank you. Thank you for that. So I think that actually the three minutes may have just elapsed. I it's, do all, it's all right, Lynn and I. Lynn and I agreed that I would talk at okay. this point if, if there was anything to be said. So I think we're okay. Thank you so much, Bob. So we are now going to move on to board discussion. I and asked sorry, Abby. Abby, um, sorry. Before you move on to board deliberation, I just wanted to take a chance to respond to something that was said. As the city is um, technically the owner, um, but the timeline for the civic area phase two that. Um, Patrick O'Rourke referenced was from January from a, a council IP. Um, and so the correct timeline and the updated one is that it is in the uh, project scoping phase with site analysis starting in 2024, schematic design anticipated to begin at the end of 2024, and implementation starting in 2026. And I know Christopher Johnson is here um, two, to add anything, he's been involved in um, uh, developing the RFP for that project. Yeah, thanks, Marcy. I'll just I'll just confirm that as well. That um, the uh, the actual uh, analysis site analysis really runs through all of 24, and schematic design would run through 2025. So any kind of uh, more detailed design development construction is, is still much further out into the 2026 27 
time frame uh, and the RFP that um, will be uh, issued for some of that planning and design work um, is likely to be released sometime in the next couple of weeks. So um, by the time that process goes through and actually get consultants on board, um, I would imagine that will be at least October um, by the time any of that would actually be uh, under contract, probably closer to the end of the year. Thank you, Christopher, for clarifying that and Marcy for bringing that to our attention. Thank you. So now I think we're ready to move on to board discussion. I ask that everyone else mute your computer or phone during the duration of this discussion. And Aubrey, I know you're going to keep a timer or kind of do a time check for us as we proceed with this discussion. And um, I really don't remember my Robert's rules of orders that well, but I don't believe I'm I'm happy to jump in and start this discussion, but I don't I can't remember if that's kind of forbidden for the chair to do so. It is go for not. it. Okay. Go for it, Abby. Yeah. Wait, I can go for it? No, please go for it. Oh, okay. Sorry. So uh, <clears throat> so I just there's this wonderful report that was written by Beverly Kerrigan, and it was part of the Boulder Historic Context Project, and her paper was entitled, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr., Maker of Parks, Planner of Cities. And the reason I'm calling it out in the beginning of my remarks tonight is that it, on, on the last page of her report, she says, Boulder was indeed fortunate to have a handful of citizens contact a landscaper from the east, a dedicated man who climbed up our mountains and down our ditches and presented plans that would improve with the passage of years. The parkways, open space, and ribbon of green along Boulder Creek are all elements of a lifestyle that draws visitors and citizens alike and serves as living testimony to visionary man end quote. But I wanted to start with that because I want to thank more than a handful of people who were the coalition that submitted this application, as well as the members of the public who have written us emails, spoken, and um, were with us tonight to, to share their um, share their thoughts with us as a board. So I think I thank you for your tireless time and energy on this endeavor. That same report also mentions that in 1917, Olmsted sent a telegraph to a, a telegram to a member of the Boulder Civic Improvement Association. And I think it was to Dr. William Baird, but I could be wrong. And what Olmsted Jr. was proposing is that the city of Boulder create a planning department. So Christopher, Marcy, Aubrey, Claire, um, Brad, you know, it seems like the genesis for the very department you serve came from Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. The next thing I want to point out, because there, there is a thread, if you'll bear with me just a few moments, is that when the country was celebrating its 200th birthday, and the state of Colorado was celebrating its centennial in 1976, the Denver Civic Center Historic District was designated as a landmark. This district showcases the wonderful, um, is a wonderful stunning example of the city beautiful movement that swept across the country after the 1893 Chicago World's Fair Columbian Exhibition. And the person who picked the site of that exhibition was Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. He picked a site along the shores of Lake Michigan. And after the crowds had gone away and the displays were taken down, the vast majority of buildings were raised, even Louis Sullivan's um, transportation building. Um, the only things that remained that enhanced Chicago after that World's Fair were the parkways and the waterfront designed by the Olmsted firm. And how I can connect that now to the Civic Center in Denver is the fact that Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. was one of the landscape architects on that. And what kind of blows me away about 
Denver Civic Center is that a smaller portion of that was even designated as a National Historic Landmark in 2012. And we know we have Chautauqua as a National Historic Landmark and the part in, in Denver Civic Area that is designated as a historic National Historic Landmark is one of 26 total in the state of Colorado. There is no other area in Boulder that better celebrates the best of Boulder and our progressive innovative spirit than our Civic Center and the more than 100 year old Central Park as Olmsted envisioned a lot of it as the park at Boulder Creek. The legendary names we've heard tonight James Hunter, Glenn Huntington, Sako R. DeBoer, Hobart Wagner, and last but certainly not least, Frederick Law Olmsted are all woven into this potential historic district physically with tangible connections to their work and their labors of love, and as well as woven into our history. I was grateful to be invited to be a stakeholder in the 2013 creation of the civic, uh, excuse me, the city's historic preservation plan. And it's entitled, A Sense of Place, A Sense of Purpose. On page 34 of the plan, I'm going to quote, Boulder aspires to lead by example, modeling excellent stewardship for all city owned historic buildings, including those in parks and on open space. Additionally, city owned buildings can be used effectively to illustrate successful integration of historic preservation and environmental sustainability. The city's willingness to actively participate in its own historic preservation program instills a sense of unity with owners of landmark properties and buildings within historic districts, end quote. I think that the Landmarks Board purpose tonight is to initiate this historic district. And I think that this is, um, we need to embrace it. I think the time has come. We traveled down one path a year ago, then was told to create a historic district. Members of the community came forward to do that. I think we owe it to them. I was really struck last June 14th at the city council meeting when our mayor pro tem at the time, Rachel Friend, said she was voting for the boundary expansion specifically because she was hearing from citizens, she heard the groundswell, and she doesn't want to waste people's time. She didn't want us all to have to go through this process again and again and again. When staff makes a recommendation, I know other departments are involved in that decision. One of the most important roles all of us on this board, on this call, is to foster an appreciation of historic preservation and to champion the value of it. It's possible there are dedicated city staff who are concerned about the ramifications of landmarking without understanding that it does not preclude changes, but rather preservation helps guide any changes. This district could actually become a shining example of celebrating not only our history and built environment, but dispel many of those misconceptions we come across all the time about designation and be a teaching moment that things are not frozen in time, but rather evolved to meet current needs while leaving a legacy for future generations. The poet laureate of North Carolina recently said, what we keep keeps us. I think we all need to come together and keep this place and let it keep us as somewhere to enjoy a picnic, listen to the Boulder Opera, watch a classic movie, go see an art exhibition, dine and sip tea in, in the glorious splendor of the tea house, as well as buying vegetables and fresh flowers at the farmer's market. Um, it's in the very heart of where one of our most important civic duties is, and that is raising our voices and lending them at city council meeting and other board meetings. This historic district will engender civic pride, but it does so in a place that our beloved creek runs through it and its beautifully framed vistas of the mountains brings the community together day after day after day. This district will bring us together if we can collaborate on the future reimagining of this together with other city departments. And um, 
I will be supporting initiation this evening. I don't know who'd like to go next. I'll go next. Um, especially since that's so hard to follow. That was beautifully eloquent and it encapsulated a great deal of the thinking that I've had going into this. Um, for all the reasons that have been stated tonight, for all the people that have spoken, including Marcy's argument to do this in due time. The due time part, I think, was essentially dispelled by the line of questioning that Ronnie had when it was stated that there is some flexibility there. But I think a great deal of time has gone by. This has been a convoluted process. Many processes that are worth doing are. And we've gotten to this point where it's time to act. And so I'm supporting designation at this point, the initiation. <laughs> Chelsea, Ronnie. Mark has his hand up. Mark. Um, thanks. I, I actually, I, I am, um, I'm, I'm worn uh, from last night, and uh, and this has been wonderfully interesting and fascinating. But I'm going to excuse myself after just a very brief comment, and I, I just want to say that um, this this whole discussion has reminded me of the uh, graph uh, that back in the '80s is that people would talk about important and urgent. And I find the um, proposal tonight to be very important. Um, I also uh, am not typically one to um, just blindly uh, agree with agree with staff. And uh, if Brad were still on the call, he could certainly attest that I am not a um, I see both sides kind of guy, and I can't make up my mind. However, this is this is a tough one, and I'll simply say that um, after I, I sympathize and I understand with the urgency that the that the testimony tonight uh, uh, in person, the emails have been really um, uh, they've been profound, and I and I, I really understand and sympathize with them. Um, conversely, I have. Uh, uh, experience over the last year plus with the planning department and their load and, and, and their struggles. And I know that um, Marcy and her team are not, they're part of the planning department. There's a little bit of separation there, but I, I, I'm going to sum up and say that I find this to, again, be important and um, I understand the urgency, and but would if I had a vote tonight, and finally, and I'm, maybe I'm glad I don't tonight. Um, <laughs> I would uh, I would uh, fall down on staff's side of this reluctantly, and uh, with the uh, hope that um, they would uh, hold true to their commitment to bring it forward uh, using uh, their process. So that, that's my, uh, that's where I come down tonight. And I, I again, I appreciate uh, all the discussion and it's certainly been educational. I appreciate the, uh, the, the testimony from the citizenry, both uh, in person and in writing tonight. So, and I'm gonna excuse myself now. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Kelsey? Things. Yeah, I, I have um, I have a few thoughts. Um, <clears throat> so, a historic district is a big deal, and it's a very important aspect of what we do on Landmarks Board. 
And in a lot of ways, it's a very permanent change. And I think if, if the, um, if the CLA wasn't, or the LCA, CLA, yeah. If the, um, if the CLA wasn't already underway and we had a very clear time, I wouldn't say very clear, but if we had a general time and we have a sense of the steps that are taking place, if we didn't know that those things were already happening, I would feel like there would be a better case for taking a step forward because it wasn't, we, we didn't even know, we wouldn't have even know when we would be able to get the information that is needed to truly understand what the boundaries of the historic district could be or what the validity of the historic district is. Like when I think of a historic district, I wanna go in knowing and having the information that this there's a really strong case to create a district. And I understand that we believe that there is, but there's still analysis that needs to be done to prove that that is the case. Um, and I personally want to see that. Um, and I think that the community deserves to know um, why it's so important to put all of these resources together to move in this direction. And ultimately, this was the first vote <laughs> that I took a year and a half ago when I started on <laughs> the landmarks board. And I will vote similarly tonight because the conditions are, while they have changed and while their progress has been made, materially, like the issue is the same issue and it is the premise of why I voted no the first time and while I'll vote no this time, staff is asking us to hold back because they're in the middle of a process that will make the decision making um, a stronger uh, process and a stronger decision in the end. Um, and the collaboration with parks is really important. Parks manages this land. The way that I think about this decision is that if we move forward, we are similarly moving forward to designate over an owner's objection in some ways. That's how I feel in this process because they're asking us not to designate at this time. And if we move forward and designate anyway, it is, it is at, it is, um, over the objection of the people who are running this. So I don't feel comfortable with that. And I think that they know, while we know a lot about, and I don't, I don't even include myself in that, but while a lot of people here know a lot about this area, I think that, that staff really knows the most <laughs> about this process. And um, they are on the same page, like everyone has said, they are bought into pursuing this in a way that is meaningful and effective. And while it hasn't necessarily been as efficient as many other people want, they are moving forward. And to me, it's a little bit like, like we're engaged with this process. We're getting married to the district, but there's no rush. Like this is a long-term commitment and I don't feel comfortable moving forward at this time without knowing um, the pieces of information that we don't yet know. And a piece that it's not necessarily hinging on tonight's decision, but something that I think a lot about, and one of the things that I, um, one of the reasons why I voted no the last time, which I still feel now, is that this area sees thousands of people walking through it every single day. And the fact that we're only hearing from certain groups makes me very concerned. 
Um, this is a part, this is not just, and I understand that those groups are representing others and their interest is to preserve the place as it is. Um, but I want, and I'm not, and I don't discredit that. And I think that those are very important perspectives to hear, especially in this context. But without hearing from more day-to-day -day users of the area, I just don't feel as though we've done enough diligence in having a community feedback process to this at this point. Um, and I know that that will happen once designation occurs, whether it's now or in the future, but it does not make me comfortable um, I've been a part of really big community conversations in Boulder over the last few years and 13 people providing emails like that's that's not a lot. Um, it's a very small group of people who have are having an outsized influence over what happens to the future of the heart of our community. And so I just don't feel comfortable with that at all. Um, So those are the some of the reasons that I will be supporting staff's decision. Um, and I also think that, that there's a chance that council will do the same thing that they did the last time and reject the designation because we are in the same situation and the, for the same reasons that they voted no the last time, so. So, um, Ronnie, do you mind if I just make a few comments? Chelsea, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your point of view. I totally respect that. I'm going to push back a little bit because the input from the people who use the park every day actually happens, I think, after the initiation happens. And my concern with this is a year ago, you know, we were told not to support the boundary and go for historic district we did and then now we're supposed to support a CLA which is not part of our preservation ordinance the CLA underway can still proceed on a parallel track to designation but I just um I just have the feeling that um if we don't act tonight this just goes away the application goes away and staff might come back with us but I think my biggest concern if I understood Tina correctly is that as this if they do the CLA and we just say oh go ahead and we'll revisit this down the road at any point in that process if they have one of the 13 criteria that they don't agree with or doesn't think is met the whole process stops and they'll never be a historic district and landmarks board is no longer involved in that potential district okay Ronnie mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, I imagine that you all know what I'm going to say, because it's what I said at the beginning. Um, and, and so let me start by asking, I need to address a couple of things that have been said tonight, but I want to start by asking Lucas a question. Lucas, can you confirm that there is an opportunity to extend the 120 day um, requirement or whatever, the 120 day um standard that's in place uh after initiation to hold the hearing yeah let me clarify that um so 9115 states that for individual landmark designation applications um so not historic designations but for individual landmark designation applications the time requirements uh, may be waived if mutually agreed upon by the board the applicant and the owner um, what that means most likely is that the city and the applicants would have to mutually agree in the form of a tolling agreement. So that would be a written agreement that the city has used on occasion um, for this kind of situation. So we've heard today something that they might be willing to do that, the applicants. I think if the board were going to, I don't think the board can force them to do that. It would be more of a, an understanding of the board we hope or request that they're going to do this. Um, but ultimately, I think that's going to be a decision they make if this if this board votes to move forward. 
Does that make okay. sense? It does make sense. So I will get to that momentarily. Okay. So I had a couple of things I just wanted to say to kind of address a handful of things that have come up tonight. First of all, the gratitude piece. Um, a lot of people have worked on this and brought us to the point we're at today. And I understand that it has been a long effort. And it's because of many individuals that were where we are tonight. And can you still hear me? Can Lucas, can you raise your hand if you can hear me? Okay, great. Um, so, you know, I don't want to overlook that. Um, and I really just want to say, you know, thank you for your efforts. I do also hear that there's quite a bit of frustration and to some degree, some anger um, because of the process. And I think maybe expectations that were put in place um, that may or may not have been delivered upon or may or may not have been um, you know, fulfilled in ways um, that people were hoping. And so I, I also do hear that. Um, I want to clarify that I do not think that our staff or our board thinks that an integrity interpretation um, associated with the CLA is the pivot point for us to make a decision about whether or not initiation um, should happen. So I don't think that is the piece that we're focusing on. I think what we're hearing from staff is the report itself and the content um, may illuminate additional information and it may not, um, but that that process along with um, working with other departments and making a more robust and timely communication um, with, a, I'm sorry, community engagement effort um, is the reason why they were suggesting um, that we don't, do not initiate tonight. I do have to say there's been a major change in our um, preservation program. And that is we, we had our senior preservation planner retire. And then we were without a, pres a senior preservation planner for a while. And that we are extremely fortunate to have Marcy. And I am so grateful that she is here helping us. And I promise you that in every interaction I've had with her, and I meet with her often as a board member, that she continues to demonstrate extreme knowledge about the subject matter and personal integrity um, whenever she's conducting herself. And so it's very hard for me to hear any type of attack to her this is our common responsibility, pushing these things forward. I think we hear truthful information from Marcy. I think if there has been any conflict of information, there's nothing intentionally deceptive. Um, and I think that we would be further behind in this process had she not been the applicant or an applicant in the process of selecting a new senior preservation planner. Okay, so I want to one recognize that the timeline may be delayed and that the words end of year this year came up from a previous preservation planner. And those are use like loose terms and that we have somebody that is an amazing person on our staff helping us and that we should respect that. And I do. So I'm grateful that Marcy's here. And I really feel like I have to say that because it's hard to digest when I hear this. That's not to diminish anybody's experience that they may be frustrated because I understand why you would be as well. Okay, so what about this? Um, just going back to um, kind of what I said at the beginning, I think some of the frustration comes out of the commitment piece, which is about the timing and the follow through. And another frustration is about a potential consequence, which is lack of protection and how lack of protection is demonstrated that some valuable asset may just not show up on a drawing, which means that someone may move forward and, you know, jeopardize um, parts of our community that we think do need protection and preservation. So for that reason, I would like to propose initiating tonight to come through on the protection piece that will come with the initiation. 
to demonstrate that there's a commitment from our board and our preservation program and our staff and to also have a conversation with the applicant about a tolling agreement based on a realistic timeline that can incorporate the aspects that staff in Chelsea has, um, I you know, reiterated, um, that are being asked that will let this process unfold in a reasonable manner for them. And so on that note, Marcy, I'm wondering if you could help us understand what a possible extension to the 120 days might be that could be reasonable so that I can understand that and maybe we could talk about that. And Ronnie, as always, you're articulate and eloquent. And one thing, Marcy, if you could also do, I know you had mentioned that earlier, you wanted to really know the timing piece. Marcy, I believe the threshold question tonight, and if there's a slide you can pull up, is, is there probable cause that this is a historic district? And if so, initiate. And I think, Ronnie, you said something that resonated with me about that is sort of what's in front of us tonight, correct? Even though the timing piece is something that could be discussed additionally. I, I believe that this meets the requirement for initiation as staff has described by all of the criteria that is the people, the place, the et cetera. And staff has said the very same thing. Yeah, I think I just, what they're looking for is additional information from the CLA and a uh, timeline that allows them to service this with, um, you know, appropriate um, staffing. Ronnie, there was there was one little piece that I intended to mention that didn't come out of my mouth for some reason. Um, Patrick, I believe, said that there would be resources available from historic Boulder and other groups that could be leveraged to get some of the outreach part of this done. And so I think that's something that needs to be mentioned too. Some one of the one of the citizen presenters made that statement. Okay. Mm -hmm. That, well, that, yeah, for sure. And, and can, so can, that, I, can I can I can I go back to my question to Marcy though? I just am curious, Marcy, if you could answer um it first of all, your thoughts on it. And if you could answer my question about timing. Um, yes. So you're you're asking um for my reaction to the proposal of um having um like initiating tonight, but having some sort of tolling agreement jointly with the applicants to extend the timeline to provide time to do the, the work that we described before. Is that Yes, that, absolutely, that's correct. Yes, um, so um, I think that's a good approach. I think that um, it is something that we could work with. And um, so the answer is um, yes, we're open to that. Great. Your second question was about like a, a window or a time frame, And I wonder, Lucas, is that something we need to determine tonight or is that something we could work through with the applicants and um, and have an agreed upon time in, in an agreement? Um, yeah, I don't think you need to decide that tonight. I mean, you could put something in a motion to you know, encourage a tolling agreement for a specific time frame. Um, but if we don't really know at this moment, then I, I don't think we would have to do that. And it would be more of a, a request or a hope anyway. So we could probably do that at a later time. I just wanted to answer Abby's question, Chris, for the criteria for review, what um, Marcy has put up on the screen. It's We're also looking at the current resources available, number number two. Right, but I know there was a slide, Marcy, at the, I'm thinking of the other slide. Where it was oh, Abby, Abby, can I just ask you, are you suggesting that we do not pursue a tolling agreement? No, no, that's a totally separate issue. 
I just, there was a slide, Marcy, that had less language. I thought, and forget it. It's it's not worth going back and forth about it. I do, if it comes to a tolling agreement, um, and I actually remember years ago when Historic Boulder was engaged in a tolling agreement with the moving of Johnson's Corner, and we have that with the Walls, Walnut Street property. Marcy, I think you said something. I just want to clarify. Um, I think you said something that, that is important. I think you said a tolling agreement with the applicants, including the two friends groups and Historic Boulder. So thank you for saying that. So, I, I mean, I would like to have that discussion, um, maybe just by a show of hands for my fellow board members. Can I try to instigate that discussion with the applicants? I think it would be valuable. Okay, so I think that's at least three. So it looks like it's all four. Um, and since I'm making this up, you, you know, anybody else, is, you know, staff, you're welcome to make it up. I was wondering if we could start with um, Bob. And then, and maybe I could get some assistance on other um, representatives that might be here because I don't see everybody. Bob, are you still there? His name is. I am, and I just promoted Leonard again. If he's still around. Wait, I'm still here. Sorry. Cool. Hello, well, Bob. Yeah, oh, I mean, um, I start, you know, I start my video. Okay. Sorry, I've been waiting for the host to do things that uh, need doing. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to have that conversation. Okay, that sounds seems, great. Um, seems and, uh, seems like a very reasonable, uh, you know, kind of way forward. And Marcy, uh, which other representatives should we be calling on? Um, what? Uh... Uh, I could, I, I, I could take that on, Marcy, if you want. I mean, I'll, well, I'll... I, I would just say, if you're asking my opinion, Ronnie, it would be to not figure this out at eleven o'clock on a Zoom call. Um, my, my request or my um, preference would be that we hear your intent, um, which is to figure out a time that that both moves it along in maybe a reasonable time, but provides the time that we as case managers feel we need to do the, the level of analysis and community outreach and that we hear that um, direction from the board and then um, with fresh coffee fueled energy, <laughs> um, Lucas and um, you know representatives from the applicant group and staff, we all meet and then decide on a, a specific timeline. Can I um, ask Tina if she can weigh in on what is currently being discussed? Well, Tina, can I just say Tina's schedule is set for us already. Like she says, by October, they will finish. Well, I would their... like to ask Tina. So can I please ask Tina? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, so you're asking my opinion on um, on the extension port portion of it, is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, would you be would you be comfortable with um, the proposal from others is to move forward with designation and but to extend the timeline um, to whatever I suppose what however much time is needed to complete all the tasks. Um, before the hearing date. And so what are, I just wanna hear your reaction to that. Yeah, so I don't necessarily get a weigh in, but my reaction to that is, um, so that initiation with an extended timeline, I think just shows things that I that we're trying to express anyway. So that, that protection, um, and the commitment piece of it, I feel like as a department, we're committed to that. And so if that's what they need to show that, um, I think we're committed to that either way. We're committed to that protection. We're not going to start that civic area planning until um, there's, an, you know, like we have a result from this, you know, and they're going to be combined. And regardless of the outcome, we're going to be talking to historic preservation folks because of the adjacent properties. 
Um, so I think of it, you know, as Ronnie was saying that those pieces that they're really mm -hmm. thinking about is if this is the piece that's going to sort of prove that commitment and that protection. Um, I, as a staff member, is, is comfortable with it, right? This is also something that, would, you know, I would want to, you know, have, you know, a department level um, buy-in on it as well. So like Marcy's idea of what is that timeline and, and talking about it in that morning with that fresh coffee, I think would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, and then one other question I have uh, it's related to Tina potentially is it was in the memo it talked to or and we talked earlier about how the CLA could potentially impact how the lines are drawn in the boundary of the historic district. And so I'm just I'm I'm not sure if someone can answer this of how moving forward, like let's say the historic district as proposed today, it turns out based on the CLA is not actually the way that we think it should look in the long term. Like how do we how do we um, coalesce around an updated version? Is that possible if in the in the way that we're currently trending of approving it tonight? Um, this might be more of a Marcy question, but as I understand it, right, in this process, there is the opportunity to kind of to change that property line if it makes more sense throughout the, the process. Is that true, Marcy? Yeah, so the boundary can be modified through the process and um, up until council, you know, would de would vote on the designation. Yeah. And Marcy, that even includes a name of a historic district, correct? Yeah, that, I mean, that gets sorted out through the process. Correct. Yeah, the process allows for some evolution of the definition. Okay, Th thank you. That's very helpful. Um, I, I would like to make a motion. I do not know how to incorporate the tolling agreement To ask Lucas, do we? I, need... I just uh, I just sent some to Marcy or okay. and uh, Claire and Aubrey um, to perhaps put onto the the motion on screen if we have if we have one. Just a sentence, and, and it's hopefully gets the message across. And, and while that's happening, I just wanted to circle back to one other thing here, which is. Um, you know, kind of the frustration piece. And one thing that I think we can do as we progress, and I know that we do this, but just to maybe a, a, a more robust version of reporting on a timeline for this project, like regularly, and showing how it might change and update, not that there cannot be changes, not that it's fixed. And my personal request is that there's a graphic representation of it that's easily digestible. Um, that shows us kind of a totality of things that we might expect and experience and windows of times in which they might occur. And I believe that might help a lot of people feel like they're both understanding what's happening, knowing when they have greater opportunity to engage um, and seeing when things um, may change based on, you know, undetermined things today. So I, I can make a motion if you guys have it, want to pop it up. Okay, and somewhere in here, the tolling is at the end. Okay, no restrictions. Yeah. Okay. All right. And and I hope that this is a celebration for everybody. You know, I know we're late on in time here, but I move that the Landmarks Board adopt a resolution, attachment B, to initiate the historic district process 
for a portion of the civic area as shown in figure two, finding that it meets the criteria for such initiation pursuant to section 9113, initiation of designation for individual landmarks and historic districts of the Boulder Revised Code 1981 and in balance is consistent with the goals and policies of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. This resolution is passed with the understanding that the applicants are willing to extend the timelines in sections 9114 and 9115 BRC 1981 to allow the CLA and other necessary components of the process to be completed prior to the designation hearing described in section 9115. The Landmarks Board strongly encourages the applicants and historic preservation staff to work together to execute a tolling agreement with the city to accomplish this goal. I second that. Is there any um, amendments to Ronnie's motion or any discussion from the board members? I don't see any raised hands or hear from anyone. So we will do the roll, roll call vote. Chelsea? No. John? Aye. Ronnie? Aye. And I vote aye, so the motion carries three to one. And then Marcy, um, and I know this is different than in proposed uh, motion language prior to the meeting, but I know you'll um, discuss next steps briefly. Yeah, I, I don't have a graphic, but Ronnie, I hear you for um, a timeline that is both um, informative and, and nice looking. So we'll work on that. Next steps for this, um, uh, app, based on the outcome of initiating is that we'll reach out to the applicant group um, to meet and uh, work out a tolling agreement, and then um, staff will work uh, to begin the, um, well, continue the efforts uh, to prepare, and then the, it will come back to the Landmarks Board for a designation hearing. Um, the timing will be based on that tolling agreement. Okay. Thank you, Marcy. Well, I mean, again, I hope that this is a celebration. Um, I know that it feels a little contentious. It's an awfully quiet right now. Um, <laughs> but I think that this is a huge step forward. And um, I am hopeful again that, you know, we can continue to move forward with the same level of support and, um, you know, see this come to fruition. So thank everybody for coming and participating yet again um, for something that I think will have a uh, really significant impact on our city. And, and Ronnie, I wanna echo your, your sentiments. I think that, you know, and I know this, I know there's competing interests in multiple departments and I do understand that, but I think ultimately this is a legacy that everyone who is supporting it, everyone who is working hard to get a CLA completed and so forth, I do think this will be a real cause for celebration and we'll be leaving something, you know, again, for future generations. And thank you, Bob, Leonard, Catherine, um, you know, those of you who, who led this application because um, it came from the citizens. It came from a com community groups. And I think that's very meaningful. Yeah, I want to I want to also, I guess, echo the fact that this is a celebratory thing. I think it's a first step in an inver it's a very important first step in what I think is gonna be at some point a bigger process in Boulder that is going to be, I guess, make this something like the nucleus of a much larger structure of, of parks and I guess ecological districting along the creek that is gonna to need to happen for a number of reasons. And I also think that the thing I heard that swayed me the most strongly 
is the fact that the citizenry was very involved in wanting this and ultimately they're the real owners of the place so the owners were coming to us and saying we want this designated the city is the steward that's been put in the position of of stewarding the land and delivering what the ultimate owners want so I'm very happy with this and thank you to everybody that had mm -hmm. any part of this and thanks for everybody and this discussion this evening, all the board members mm -hmm. and everybody else. <clears throat> yeah, and I would, I would love to encourage um, Bob and Leonard and Catherine and others who are really involved in making this happen to um, really think about how to reach out to and bring people into this process who are not typically a part of historic preservation activities, younger people, communities of color, um, renters, students, the people who use the park on a daily basis. I would love to see more advocacy and support from those people. Um, so if you can take ownership of helping to bring those people along this process, I think that would really help to make sure that this decision is not just um, a decision made by a smaller group of people, but by the whole community. What else is on our agenda tonight? Yeah, matters. Hopefully matters. it's- uh... There we go, there we go. Um, I think it's uh, it's all getting late, so thank you. Um, we just have a couple of things under matters to cover. Um, and that is that the Landmarks Board recruitment, uh, here's an update. We had two applicants um, apply for the board. The interviews were yesterday, yesterday. Um, morning and um, council will appoint the new landmarks board member on August 3rd. That means that their first um, meeting will be September 6th, um, but that provides um, time in August for a new member orientation. And I would um, love for the sitting members um, to participate in that, kind of share here, you know, what I wish I would have known as a new board member or something along those lines, um, kind of share that. So um, uh, maybe we'll follow up, but kind of want to check, uh, gauge interest in maybe doing a um, crowdsourced orientation. Um, and then maybe we look towards a retreat in the fall uh, once the new member has had a meeting or two and then a reminder that um, it'll be a full eight months, but this term is technically only eight months long, and then they'll have the option to reapply for a five-year term uh, in March. Any questions or conversation about a new Landmarks board member? I Are there I mean, I... applications available? Did you say what available? Are there, are there applications available oh, that we can that's... That's a great question. Um, yeah. Let me ask the um, city clerk's office. I know that the interviews were recorded and will be public. Um, so I'm guessing the applications are as well. I will say we had two highly qualified um, people and I think I can share who that is, which is um, Renee Goblik is an architect. You'll recognize her name from last meeting where she was the architect of that accessory building does work in historic districts. Um, kind of the theme of her uh, interview was integration with um, the building permit process and helping kind of streamline that, identify uh, code issues early and um, kind of a, a working with the owner, uh, the owners through design review. And then the second um, applicant uh, is Jim Lindbergh who has worked at the National Trust for over 30 years. Um, he also is involved in the Master's uh, Historic Preservation Program in Denver. And um, he recently moved to Boulder. And so he's looking to get involved. Um, and so he's applied. So 
Um, so grateful for candidates and extra grateful for very two very highly qualified candidates. And it was cool because they both uh, attended the site visit of this potential historic district. Oh, I guess this initiated historic district. There you go. Yes. Now initiated. I mean, I, I would um, possibly be up for a meeting with the selected person um, if you need somebody. And also, um, I think my term is up in eight months. Um, so you probably want to keep that other person that doesn't get selected around. I thought you had at least another year and a half on me. I don't think so. I say this every year. It's like it's coming up. I think it's coming up. And yours and Marcy, Ronnie would be replaced by a design professional, right? That's correct. I'm going to check right now, but you don't have to wait for me. I'm no, pretty I thought, sure. I thought mine was in 2025 and it's 2026. <laughs> It'll fly by, Abby. I'm not good at math. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'll, I'll follow up with some dates. Maybe it's something as casual as a coffee, uh, something like that. Mine's 2025. Gosh, it's like, oh, that's this what doesn't happened. end. I think they're going in and changing Five the more dates. Years. True. All right. Is that possible? Um, Never going to Wrap your head around, around that one. Um, so then the only other thing that I had for you all under matters is that um, we wanted to follow up on the board's discussion last month about proposed changes to the LDRC. Um, staff has met, we did a little brainstorming um, workshop a couple of weeks ago and we'll come to you in August. Um, it looks like that should be a pretty light agenda, which is helpful considering everything else that will be going on, um, but we're, we're planning to come back to you all with some um, ideas for changes to the LDRC to get your feedback. Great. Thank you. Okay, we're not forgotten. Okay, and that's all we have. Um, if anyone's curious why I put this picture up, um, there's no reason other than I was looking for a fun historic photo I hadn't seen and I absolutely love her. Um, here and it kind of matches the decorative porch and if you're curious this is a house in the um, Highland Lawn Historic District but the porch has um, uh, that decorative piece is no longer there. We, we don't see it you have to put oh it my up. god that's embarrassing okay it's, okay. it's late <laughs> I thought I had eight more months are my yeah, eyes I just broke well, I know someone mentioned waiting for coffee to discuss the tolling agreement I'm like still waiting for dinner I'm waiting for dinner okay I couldn't there it out. is yeah. oh that's cool everyone that's appreciates cool. this cool photo here's the uh, entire house if you're curious oh, oh my cool. goodness so cool that's awesome Okay, well, and does it still note. have that porch? So yeah, this this kind of funky porch is no longer there. Mm. The, the porch roof is, but all the decorative kind of spindles are gone. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So you guys, thank you for this. You know, and this was a this was a hard issue to do. You know, but thank you for taking the time and staff for staying and hanging in while we had this kind of robust discussion. But I think it was very important. We haven't done a historic district since 2006, so it's a lot, you know. So if that's it, the meeting is adjourned at 11:24 p.m. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Marcy.